everybody and welcome to our Theros R&D interview. I'm super excited. It's been a long time since I've had Zach Hill on the Magic Show talking about Magic cards. You kind of went into the, not the black hole, but you went to, sort of, you went to the Wonka factory. You stayed there. You made cool stuff. You left the Wonka factory. You're making even more cool stuff in Boston now with the... Uh, uh, not the dream project, the, but the, the future, future project. project. And the MIT Game Lab. Yep. Also doing a lot of cool stuff. I'll probably be spamming social media about it. Excellent. So, uh, Excellent. And we will be paying attention as ZDCH, <laughs> I believe it is, correctly. Um, but anyway, so what I wanted to do today was talk about Theros, about the design, about the development. He was on both the design and the development. This is sort of your your baby. I mean, you know, you worked well, on stuff after it, but this was like a big, big thing for you before you left Wizards. Yeah, so Mark Rosewater is the lead designer, Eric Lauer the lead developer. This is mm -hmm. their first collaboration since Innistrad. Uh, I hear that was a pretty good eh, set. Kind of a pedigree, eh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was on the design team and the development team. And why is that? Can you explain why you were put on both teams? Yeah, so one of the things Wizards does is they usually like to have a uh, designer and developer, or, or a developer be on the design team so that they can represent things that are likely to be the development perspective earlier in design. Mm. Why that's important is like if you have some mechanic that's like, you know, just some card advantage mechanic or something, mm -hmm. you like based your entire set around it, mm -hmm. and then it's just like, look, we, we can't make a set around this because this power <laughs> level is too insane. The other thing is just gameplay considerations. So mm -hmm. a lot of the time, design play tests, mm -hmm. everything is flat so you can try out more stuff. Mm -hmm. But there are certain things you're going to need to be able to intuit of just like we're not going to be able to make constructed about this. Mm -hmm. Or the limited environment's not going to be able to support the following things mm -hmm. if that's what's good. So they want that perspective early on so you don't have to change the set around, mm -hmm. you know, weeks, months, Several months and, later, and basically this like that has happened. All those oh, things yeah. you were explaining, yeah. like you can't make your set around this, you can't make limited work with that, and then that happens so late in the process before they just sort of try to back it up and get a developer in yeah. there first. Yeah, and uh, I, I worked on Return to Ravnica design too. I tend to also just make a lot of cards kind of out of nowhere. Sure. So I get to be the development rep, but I'm also kind of one of the individual card design guys. Is there anything the that you're team? super proud of before Theros? Anything that you sort of had a hand in in terms of cards or mechanics or, you know, like your... Oh, I, yeah, I mean, there, there's... It's almost hard to think of everything. I can imagine. Um, I, you worked on a lot. Like, my favorite individual card design that was just, like, brain-to-print, like, cards is probably Gravecrawler. Oh, wow. It's just, like, you know, a zombie just keeps coming back, you wow. know, and uh, I, I like aggressive creatures. Right. I think for most of Magic's history, aggressive cards haven't been good enough. True. So, you know, it was kind of one of the, the very pushed cards. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that me and Brad would talked about in the set review was that there's a lot of uh, everybody gets a Savannah line. Right. You know, you get a Savannah line and you get a Savannah line. It's very much Oprah giving out Savannah lines. <laughs> and Black's got like an uncommon one. The white one is insane because it's like yeah. protection from Ravnica. And, you know, there's a, there's not a blue one. Well, there's the blue one, but it returns a you know, or a creature to your right. hand or something the, from the, Ravnica. Yeah, right. The, yeah, the blue sprite one. Right. Yes. That I can't remember the name of ever. Um, but but yeah, so so the idea that creatures are getting better and it kind of makes me a little sad and that Savannah lines are kind of basically outclassed in a variety of ways. But, you know, these days, you know, you can actually see it in cubes. The cubes these days, all the spells are old, all the creatures oh, are new. Yeah. And, and it's, I mean, you know, the, uh, people sort of talk about that like, mm -hmm. oh, it's a direction of magic thing. We want a gameplay style to be there. And that's definitely true to an extent. Sure. But if you look at just like older decks mm -hmm. and just like what creatures will be capable of doing, like mm -hmm. it's really a math problem, right? I mean, Frank sure. Karsten just wrote an article about this recently of like mm -hmm. how to write a program of, you know, to build the best aggressive deck that can deal 20 as fast. Mm -hmm. If you just go back to old formats and do that, you, the aggro decks just aren't fast enough. Right. Like, if you took the bad card drawing spells or comparatively, you know, you don't have to give them fact. If you just give people, like, divinations right. and terrors, like, no aggressive deck until, like, 2009 could just beat that. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, it, 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 I mean, they, they really were just mathematically miscosted for a long time. Hmm. And it turns, you know, for a long time, you know, you could not get a one power creature for two mana. You're a jackal pup. You were just like, wow, you know, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. my birthday. Right. And uh, <laughs> it, it, you're just, an aggro deck isn't going to be fast enough to compete with the spells in the format unless you lower that curve a little bit. Right. So, so two power for one mana needs to exist in a lot of different colors so that it can have a chance. Exactly. Versus the super control -y whatever. Like, right. for example, the new Elspeth that we'll talk about shortly. <laughs> <laughs> just 
completely crushed my brains. Oh yeah. Against because Brad Nelson had one, and that card is. It's not a bad national card. Ridiculous. That's right. So let's focus here. Let's talk about Celestial Archon. Let's say you're you're working on the set. The story, at least as has been told right. so far, is that Billy Moreno made bestow for Born of the Gods. Right. And then we're like, and then someone on the designer development team of Theros was like, hey, that would be really awesome in the main set. And then you sort of took it from there. Oh, of course. I mean, so Bestow is an interesting story. So there, there's design teams and there's advanced design. Billy Moreno was probably the developer with the best design sensibility. I mean, everyone's sort of different, but Billy was doing a lot of design work, almost as much design work as he was doing development work. Hmm. And so he was sort of working in advance of sets mm -hmm. to kind of say, look, here's a reasonable idea of, of what this is going to be about, even though the team hasn't started yet, mm -hmm. so that earlier sets can be designed with later sets in mind. Mm -hmm. But the other thing you do is think about, okay, how are you going to evolve what the first set has? Right. So Bestow was originally an evolution of just a set that was basically about creatures and auras. Hmm. The issue with that is you need a certain amount of creatures, mm -hmm. you need a certain amount of auras, right. or, or just non-creature spells, right. and if you don't have things that are both, you're just not going to be able to have a high enough density for either enchantment creatures, which mm -hmm. we wanted to be a thing, mm -hmm. or auras to matter in your set. Gotcha. So we wanted some cards that could kind of do both things. Mm -hmm. The other sort of practical consideration, I don't know how much this is a part of the story, but it's definitely something I was thinking about, definitely conversations that we were having. Mm. We just wanted the set to have something like new and cool that felt operatively different. So like Monstrous we loved, but right. that's just an activated ability, it's really. True. You know, you've got uh, Devotion, which is... It's already been a thing right. in the form it's of Chroma. It's Chroma-esque, yeah. Yeah, you, you have Heroic, but that's not, that doesn't make anything work differently. Right. It's, it's like text on a card, right? Like you could have in any set, whatever if, card whatever name is targeted, targeted. Make ball wall happen. It doesn't have to be keyworded. Right. right. So we wanted something like Bestow that really just was a thing that had never happened before. Mm. You know, because like we also did Scry before, right? So, so right. It, it added a little bit of spice to the set. Mm -hmm. It let us make really cool looking cards like Celestial Archon that, I mean, literally look really cool. Like you look at the border, <laughs> it just looks cool. Border's awesome, you know? the card's sweet, crushes me in limited. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Yeah, so, so the idea was to be able to just make some like really ho high profile straightforwardly powerful cards. It also encourages you to use auras mm -hmm. without uh, you know, getting card disadvantage, which is the traditional drawback of auras. What we knew would happen was if we made it so that it worked like it always did and people were scared to play auras because their guy's going to get killed in response, right. if everyone has that fear, it's not just that the mechanic doesn't work. Right. It's that no one's going to want to play your set. Right. It makes the, it makes playing the set feel bad. Right. Essentially. Yeah. I mean, like Mark Rosewater always says, you don't want to fight human nature. Hmm. And human nature is, I'm not supposed to play these enchantments. You know, once you learn enough to know what card advantage is. Right. I'm not supposed to play these because they're bad. Right. You're not going to be able to make an aura set if auras are bad. So bestow is our way of kind of making auras good. Absolutely. And uh, and it certainly works out. You know, I oh, think yeah. one interesting thing for me about Bestow is that it's actually on commons. Right. And the New World Order is all about, there's only so many words on commons, yeah. there's only so many things that commons can do. And it's actually, for me, if, if there were anything that you could sort of see negatively is that Theros is sort of complex in some yes. ways and can be a little sort of overwhelming at times. Uh, how did you feel about putting it on commons? Yeah, that was a huge decision. Hmm. Um, the, the rationale eventually was, hmm. These have to be at common or they're not going to do their job. Right. If they're not at common, it doesn't make sense why they're in the set. The whole point is to raise the as fan or the, the number per pack of auras mm -hmm. while keeping creatures the same. So if it's not at common, it can't do that. Eventually what we decided was if you try to like spell out on a rule book what bestow is, mm -hmm. it's very weird and doesn't make a lot of sense. But once you play it a couple of times, it's like the most intuitive thing ever, right? You just put this on that. Right. When this goes away, you still have this. Right. And Billy Moreno would actually do that with cards. He would hold them over each other. He's just like, all right, I'm going to tell you what this does. Mm -hmm. And he'd just be like, I put this here, and when this goes away, this is still here. <laughs> yeah, you know, the, the aura is still there. And right. once you just internalize that, right. you don't have to read all the weird text on the card. Right. And, you know, we, we made it so that they all boosted, you know, what their power and toughness was. They gave what their abilities were. Right. So we hoped that once you played with it a couple of times, mm -hmm. you would quickly encode that complexity, like, in your mind mm -hmm. and not have to process what it did every time. But it was definitely a substantial risk. Cool. I mean, I, I do think that Bestow just gave gives the whole, the set, you know, a whole different level of interesting things that it's doing 
it, it cool. deck building and when we were playing out there in the pre-release like you could tell there was there's a certain finesse in knowing when to yeah. play the creature or when to hold it and bestow it later right. or you know do I need the wind drag now or do I hold it and then getting this other thing plus two plus two and flying well I can't do that because he's attacking and blah 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 so like it was a really terrific sort of push pull of I do this now, I do this later, the costs are different. It allows you as the developer to play with those right. costs, what they're supposed to be and what they're not. Um, and, and ultimately just probably just a ton of really cool gameplay. Cool, yeah, I'm glad you like it. I, I was having a lot of fun with it and I definitely never knew when to cast which side of it. So. Right, it was cool. All right, I'll so that's Celestial that. Archon. Yeah. Here's Chain to the Rocks now. There is the story of Prometheus. This is probably, I think, the most flavorful card in the whole set. It's just brilliant. I loved it from the moment I saw it or I even heard of it. Yeah. Um, Absolutely amazing. Uh, can you sort of tell me, was this, you know, did you have any hand in this? Did it come late? Did it come early? Yeah, th this card has been around for like two and a half years. This card wow. was like in one of the earliest uh, templates of the file mm -hmm. as an example of tropes that could also be cards to kind of convince people that the Greek mythology thing was resonant. Mm -hmm. I think the only change to this is now that you have to enchant a mountain you control, mm -hmm. originally it could enchant any mountain so it was good against other red decks. Right. Um, th there were upsides and downsides to that. We expect red to be one of the best colors in Theros standard, so it was nice that you could just board this in against red. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there was another cycle of color hosers that we wanted to bring into it. And I mean, you, Swords to Plasher is just a really good card. Swords so to Plasher is pretty <laughs> sweet, pretty excellent card. Right, so we decided that, okay, we're gonna need you to have to play an actual red-white deck. Right. But this card was basically exactly like this for as long as I could remember and was one of sort of five or six cards that we really wanted to hold a lot of story weight while feeling like magic cards. Wow, yeah, and it, it absolutely does. Uh, you know, like, of course, you know, and it's sort of, it's, it's expected that when it can't, when it comes out and you're like, wow, this is really cool. And then you go, but Mountain, you control. Right. And then Sam's thought was just like, well, it's kind of annoying. Blue Eye Control brings in versus red. Yeah. And then the magic show, I was like, that's the point. You know, like, I'm supposed to be really annoying against Mono Red because I'm Blue White Control. It's nah. my job. But I agree that it's it's a little weird. It can be a little overpowered in some ways, um, if not just sort of unintuitive that you're chaining my own creature to my rocks. Like right. that's weird. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, just a really cool design. I thought it was. It's one of my favorite cards. It, yeah, it's just one of those where you go like, I get it. I get <laughs> it. I totally get it. I love it. It makes sense. It's beautiful. Picture is sweet. Works with Greek mythology. I mean, it's just all all that stuff worked. It was brilliant. Tell me about Elspeth. Yeah, so Elspeth uh, it went through several different designs. There was originally a four cost Elspeth that only cost three and a white. Um, basically, yeah, it, it was juicy. Might, <laughs> might come out later. But, you know, with Garrett Call of Beasts, we knew with the Titans removed from standard, mm. there was space for like powerful six mana cards. Mm. We knew we'd sort of, or we definitely missed on Chandra Ablaze. Soren saw some fringe play. Soren actually think it was a pretty underrated card. Right now, it's Chandra. Yeah, Sh yeah. Soren actually, I actually looked back because at one point I was sort of looking at all the planeswalkers and right. ranking them. And I'm like, well, Soren did see some Pro Tour play. Oh, he yeah. saw like one of in the control decks or one in the sideboard mm -hmm. versus the control decks. Um, Chandra Blaze, as I recall, at least the story is that she had a lot of changes at the very yeah. end of her development. So yeah. like, they're like, we don't want to do anything bad, so go. Yeah, and it was still a pretty popular card. Actually. It, it certainly was, and Conley Woods did play it at the Pro Tour, <laughs> famously enough. Huh. Uh, didn't do great at that Pro Tour, but he still played it. But Elspeth here, you know, like you had Elspeth Terrell, which was okay. I mean, she was fine. Yeah. Obviously Knight Errant's like, whew, you know, that kind yeah, of... One of the best cards ever. Yeah, I don't know if I want to call it a mistake, but I will say it's like pushing the absolute boundary of what a Planeswalker should be doing. It's really good. Yes, I think second best, not close. Um, could could have Jay Spiller in there somewhere, but regardless... Here you are with the third Elspeth. Sort of, how do you feel as a developer in terms of the expectations that players have when it comes to Planeswalkers? Do you sort of feel that pressure of like, it's got to be pretty cool, it's got to be yeah. pretty good? I mean, yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of different philosophies about Planeswalkers. Mm -hmm. I tend to kind of try and make the Planeswalkers in my sets like very fringe of standard playable mm. because like what you're going to do is get something wrong mm. and then it's going to be good enough to play regardless because recursive card advantage is really powerful it turns out right right and then like 
y you know, it, it's just going to be a lot harder to kind of just jam it into a deck. Mm. Um, you know, so Planeswalkers I've designed include like a Johnny, uh, the three mana a Johnny. Yeah. Call, Call of, of the Pride, Pride, which you see like one of two of in some decks. Right. Uh, Liliana of the Dark Realms, which mm -hmm. unless you're Mike Flores, you see is like <laughs> one of two of in some decks. <laughs> some people try to build decks around it. Right, it's right. also kind of popular. It's like more of a casual card. Yeah, and it was cool that it was with Mutilate. Like, you know, Mutilate right. and Liliana work together and you that was neat. do a little thing or whatever. It's right. like still a, it's card advantage every time. You know, it can't be that bad. And some of it was the numbers, right? Like Liliana right. of the Dark Realms, if that has had a four mana starting loyalty so it could use her second ability to minus oh, X, yeah, minus X, it would have been a totally different card. Right. right. And, and and the thing about that is, like, you know, it, it's it's sometimes frustrating to just like play a Planeswalker that protects itself on a clear board. And right. it's just like very fatalistic. Like, okay, my best guy is dead, my opponent's strong cards. But, you know, so the card, like, not really good enough to play in standard, but not so bad that you're a giant idiot if you'd consider it. <laughs> Sin and Ral Zarek out of Dragon's Maze, like, right. really similar thing. You know, it's like two bolts, good, it can accelerate your mana, gets rid of blockers, good with Izzet's static caster, mm -hmm. but not bananas or anything. So I kind of like Planeswalkers to be around that level. There's a lot of different philosophies around them, but another philosophy is make them really good, but just make them six mana, Hmm. So that by the time they come down, the game doesn't just revolve around their repeatable effect right. starting on the third or fourth turn of the game. I think Elspeth is very clearly a card in that capacity, where it's like obviously really good, obviously a really powerful effect, right. but it, there's not a whole lot else going on at six mana in white in the format. Really, Aetherling is kind of a lot of its competition. And that was, that was yours as uh, well, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. I'm a <laughs> huge fan of Aetherling. <laughs> And, and so you look at, like, effects that you want, right? There's a history of, you know, five mana conditional wraths being playable. A steer command was a thing. Right. So with Elspeth, you kind of cost it. It's like you get a steer command, or one part of a steer command and a planeswalker. Mm -hmm. Instead of the other parts, you get the soldier ability. You get the emblem ability. Right. And you, it exists in a format where there's more big creatures. So you can think of it kind of in the context of other spells, mm. Well, also, it can just make a zillion guys. And, of course, Elspeth, Elspeth, Elspeth's shtick <laughs> is making soldier tokens. So it the first kind ability of thing. makes perfect sense. Right. You know, that's how she protects herself is that she makes her soldier tokens. And it's always really interesting to me is that, you know, the numbers are so crucial. And that's, yeah. I mean, that's what tournament players care about the most, obviously, is cost. There's, you know, there's, there's a difference. There's cancel and counterspell, right. you know, and it's only one mana there. And Elspeth, you know, like if she's five, she's incredibly overpowered. If, the, if her starting loyalty is three, that makes her a totally different card. You right. know, it's like, th there, it feels like there's this little tightrope that you have to walk every time that yeah. you develop a Planeswalker. There is. Because if you get it wrong. <laughs> everything, yeah, right. Everything, everything begins to revolve around her, and then it stops being fun. But if she's like, like powerful but not overpowered, that's kind of the key. And that's exactly where you, I mean, you, you, you've you missed if a planeswalker is just not interesting for constructing, mm -hmm. right? I think if you're doing that, like people should be getting excited about planeswalkers. People should want to be building decks around planeswalkers. Right. But you also miss if your planeswalker is too good. And if like a creature is too good, then okay, whatever, you can kill it. Right. Uh, or maybe it ends the game. You can kill planeswalkers, but it's harder. But the main thing is, like, the most dangerous space in Magic mm -hmm. is just repeatable effects that do the same thing every turn. Because mm. the, the most fun part of Magic is the variance of the draw step and the excitement of what's going to happen next and the back and forth that that produces. Right. Things that do the same effect over and over again are a really dangerous space because mm. quickly you're the game becomes scripted. You realize whether you're going to win or lose very quickly. Right. So, you know, Planeswalkers, uh, most of the uh, set's development, probably like between 15 and 20% of the time that you spend is just, uh, you know, between future, future, right, right, play for the whole thing. meetings, right. is just getting your Planeswalkers right. Wow. Because so many things go wrong if that doesn't succeed. How many how many people are sort of involved in each Planeswalker? I mean, is it all design and all development? Is it just development? Is it just the lead developer and the head designer? I mean, sort of who? Yeah. How many people are able to put input on this guy? What what usually happens is you get some Planeswalkers out of the design file, and they're, they're, you know, design realizes that its job is not really to make your Planeswalkers. It's one specific card. It's very environment dependent. Right. So it's not worth design's time to spend a lot of, you know, effort and energy making Planeswalkers. Sure. Because, you know, if like, okay, well, it turns out that everything you thought was wrong because Dreg Mangler is too good in standard <laughs> and, you know, it just all goes out the sure. door. 
So design kind of spends time on other things, and they basically work with creative to say, here are the planeswalkers that are going to be in the set. Mm -hmm. And then development is mostly who makes it. Usually development consults the lead designer, um, basically saying, hey, here's what we're going for. Does that make sense in your set? Right. Then development has several meetings, usually around the mythic rares, usually around the planeswalker. You'll submit designs from everybody. Mm -hmm. You usually want designs of people who've been playing in the future future league, playing in future standard. So they can sort of see where it would fit in standard. Yeah, exactly. Because it has okay. no place in standard, and it's, not doing, it's just kind of a boring card. Mm -hmm. So I'd say usually there's probably between 10 and 12 people involved in a regular Planeswalker design. Wow. So a lot of human beings, a lot of man hours, a lot of just playtest games, getting the numbers right. And then you as a lead developer just have to pay particular attention to all of the games and conversations around your Planeswalker. So the last thing on, on these Planeswalkers, we'll keep going, but I nah. still I find this fascinating. <laughs> um, the Ultimates. The, oh, the yeah. Ultimate. Like, and, and as I said in the Magic Show, I would, and I was like, I don't know who these ultimates are really for at this point. It's really kind of, you know, they, they matter so little. That's sort of the part of it. Like, a lot of times getting up to the ultimate mm -hmm. number is not going to happen because your opponent is dead set on you not doing that. Um, and the other half is, would it be more interesting if it wasn't an ultimate or if it was just another interesting ability? And some have that. Yeah. You know, uh, Gideon, the uh, champion right. of justice or whatever it was. You know, there's, and even Gideon, the first one, you right. know, uh, they, 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 do do, they do different things. It's just, you know, how, how important to you is the ultimate ability? Oh, to me, the ultimate is incredibly important hmm. because the ultimate is the dream. Right, the ultimate, like you're saying these planeswalkers are these immensely powerful beings that can do this cool stuff. You have to show people what the cool stuff is. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I think that there are different ways of doing it. You know, original Garrick had kind of a pseudo ultimate. Sarkin didn't really have an ultimate, or kind of did, kind of didn't. Right. Liliana of the Dark Realms, her ultimate's kind of the second part of her second ability <laughs> <laughs> uh, in, in practice. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Right. But I think, um, A, one of the reasons that you don't see ultimates happen that much is because they're good, hmm. right? So if Elspeth's ticking up, if Domri Raid's ticking up, I play a lot of Domri Raid. Domri Raid's awesome. The reason that like your opponent has to care is because the ultimate's good enough to actually beat them. Mm -hmm. So you have to worry about attacking the Planeswalker. Like right. with, with the original Elspeth, for example, oftentimes like making something indestructible where all your things indestructible is just like way worse than going to the skies and Right, and making another soldier a plus three plus three flying. Right, so right. like the better an ultimate is, mm -hmm. paradoxically, the less you're probably gonna see it happen. Sure. Because your opponent has to respect it more. Hmm. The thing is, like we're playing at a really high level where like people are paying attention to these things. Right. If you're just casting your cards, which is like what most people do, right. Ultimates happen all the time. <laughs> you know, yeah, I, in my world, it's very much tournament play. I watch a lot of tournament play. I like to play in the tournament right. practice room. You know, I'm not. I do not just play casually. If I do, it's cube, and yeah, even that's exactly. very competitive. Right. And I want to win. So you know, it's it's always paying a lot of attention to what the ultimates are and just never letting them happen. Yeah, and like and like the thing is, if your decks are really streamlined, you can actually do that. Mm -hmm. But if you're just like playing, like okay, I, you know, bought some packs, opened them, made some decks, like you're not going to be able to just threaten a planeswalker whenever you want to. Right. You know, I mean, I, so my favorite ultimate I ever made was the Rao Zarek ultimate: flip five coins, start time walking. <laughs> <laughs> I flipped a lot of coins in my life. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you just get there, and uh, sure. So, so planeswalkers, I think, are uh, the ultimate abilities. You know, some of the, again, like Domri Raids happens a lot in Constructed, at least for me. Right. I, I always play Brian Kibler decks. So. Oh, of course. But, uh, and, and, you know, other ultimates don't happen so much. I right. mean, we've won, all won games with Jace the Mind Sculptor. Some of us have won games with Jace Bellerin. <laughs> but you, you want something that you can read it and be just like, oh, like this card single-handedly can win the game. I've got to care about this. Right. And that's what I think is important. Cool. All right. So... Elspeth, I think, is totally sweet. I love it. I saw it, like, you know what I mean? Like, it's one thing to say it's really good and then right. look at it and know it's good, but, like, I played against this card and you just, like, six mana, three guys. It's so just, sick. Oh, it's so good. It's really good. It's really, really good, particularly because it's a plus one. Like, right. it's not a zero, make three guys, which would have been fine. Yeah, yeah. But plus one, make three guys was, like, is wow. So yeah, it's certainly a wowing planeswalker. I can't wait to replace Elspeth Terrell with Sun's Champion in my cube. Really excited about that. Card is totally excellent. I love it. Now, I'm sort of picking, and as you'll see, I'm kind of picking random card, random cards in here. And they're cards in here I want to talk to Zach about the sort of the development and the design mm -hmm. side. Because to me, I think there's interesting things about them that we can talk about. For example, 
Favorite hoplite is a one mana one two. That's one thing. Yeah. So it's a squire mana. You know, it's a, it's squire for just one mana. And sanctuary then, cat. And sanctuary, sanctuary cat. cat. There you go. Meow. Meow. So, yeah, me. I'm old, so I think squire. Uh -huh. um, but heroic is an interesting ability or an interesting keyword, and this one in particular is just all upside all the time. Yeah. So it's not, it's you know like. It's not just getting him a plus one plus one counter. It's not just preventing the damage to anyone, but it prevents to him. Like right. you know, so that other guy is probably still dead if they block with a two two, and you've you know t you know if do you something, anything, anything yeah. ever. So not only was it a two three, but you're going to prevent all the damage. So if they had a pump spell of their own, he's going to live. Can you tell me sort of about where this card came from and why it is the way it is? Yeah. So you look at a mechanic like heroic. You look at a set like Theros. Mm -hmm. Clearly, one of the reasons Theros exists is because one of the player's favorite things to do is play a little guy and make them huge. Right. The whole deal with Greek mythology is, you know, you start out as an ordinary person, you undergo a bunch of trials, you get more and more powerful, you confront bigger and badder foes, mm -hmm. and you overcome them. The, the entire motif is about growth, development, sustain, whatever. So you don't want your set to fight that. Right. And what that means is your set's gonna need to have some clear, obvious guys that come down early, mm -hmm. you start suiting them up and putting on pants, mm -hmm. and they just get huge and huge and huge and huge. Mm. So it, this is why like, you have a one mana card that just clearly says, like, look, I'm gonna protect myself, you don't have to worry that much, right. just put things on me and I'm gonna be awesome. And we found that our like, most popular decks with our most casual players in testing mm -hmm. were like the white, red, heroic decks. Because hmm. they just want to play guys and put pants on them and attack and like, see what happens. Right. Right. So like, you don't want to fight that urge. Then, you're, then there's no reason to make the set. Right. You want to give people the opportunity to do the thing that they want to do. Right. So don't start your heroic cards at three mana. Mm -hmm. You know, give somebody some one mana heroic cards, mm -hmm. make them non-embarrassing to play, and right. you just start dumping your hand on them. <laughs> and, and that's exactly what this card is all about. Yeah, I, I played against not not this guy, but I played against the uh, the hopeful Eidolon, the yeah. one mana one one lifelink. Yeah, and he was like. Eidolon. I'm like, all right, and mm -hmm. that's not heroic, but regardless, Eidolon. Right. And it, it, the, this guy reminded me of the of the ordeals because you were talking yeah, about exactly. you just pants him up, and I'm like, well, they had like the one man of the guy, and they put the ordeal on, and then he started getting really Two, huge, three, and, four, or five. Yeah, yeah. Then all of a sudden he's getting a bunch of life. So this guy, you put the ordeal on him, even just ordeal of of Heliod. Oh, exactly. Uh, or, or whatever it was called. I think it's Heliod. The, yeah, the white one. The white one. Yeah. yeah. The but you know you put it on this guy, and then you would attack, and not only would you prevent the damage that turn, now he's a two three. Next turn he's gonna be a three four, and then a four five. It really sort of has that Voltron build your own monster, you know, put all the things on this guy, and you're going to feel good about it because you're going to be preventing all the damage to him. Oh, that's exactly right. I mean, and, and the reason to prevent damage there is specifically so you can have these kind of stack interactions where, like, you do something, they burn it in response, maybe you, you, you target it again. That means that you don't have to constantly be boosting his toughness to dodge burn spells. Right. And also, like, you can have tricks and attack into bigger guys or block bigger creatures mm -hmm. so that, you know, he has a little bit of play. Like, even on turn six, you play a favored hoplite. Maybe they have a monster. Right. They attack with their monster. You can trick, basically, to fog the monster mm -hmm. and start doing stuff. So it's not just about, oh, I got him on turn one. It's the nut draw. Right. The card has play every phase of the game. And this is clearly one of the most powerful heroic cards, clearly one of the most pushed heroic cards. Right. Because you want that to be a, vi a viable line of play. You don't want it to be the only line of play. Right. Uh, an early problem with the set was it was too it was too easy to just put a million enchantments on your creature. Mm -hmm. But if that's not a thing that people can do, it's just going to be a big letdown. Right, then you missed sort of the, not the point, but you kind of missed a big a big part of why the set exists. Exactly. Exactly. So Favorite Hoplite is really cool. Now tell me about Heliod, God of the Sun, and just the gods in general. I'm sure there's sort of a lot of interesting play and where the gods came from and what they do and why they do what they do and all that stuff. So sort of give me the give me the god story from yeah, Zach's uh, point of view. I'll talk a lot about Heliod because my pre-release deck had two of them in it. Uh, really rough life that I lead. Yeah, I'm yeah sure it's you real life. This is Zach Hill, ladies and uh, gentlemen. Yeah. Two Heliots. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. And I still lost some games. <laughs> <laughs> Embarrassed. Somehow. The, the whole deal with the gods, uh, they went through a lot of different iterations. The only thing we, wanted, we knew for sure was that we wanted them to be legendary enchantment creatures. Okay. Gods. 
Uh, we, wanted, we knew we wanted to call them gods. We knew that Greek mythology set, Greek mythology world would not make any sense without gods. Right. Because, I mean, they were central to everything about Greek life and culture. Right. Now, there was a point where magic was, you know, there was Wrath of God and there was the right. pentagram on cards yeah. and there was Demonic Tutor and all that crap. And so then there was like, you know, there, there was sort of, you know, there was a lot of parent groups that all of a right. sudden got upset and this was before magic was popular right. and blah, blah, blah. And so now we've kind of come around to it's okay to mention Dimensions. mythology and theology and just, you know, have it be this thing and it's it's just a fantasy game and people treat it as such. Exactly. And, and this clearly is a fantasy situation, right? right. You've yeah. got a dude who's half knight with a big spear with <laughs> horn things. I don't know, maybe it's an olive wreath. Anyway, the, the goal of this, I, I mean, a, a big goal of ours was to align the, the sort of classically Greek, Greek pantheon mm -hmm. with the five colors of magic. Mm. Right, and kind of create magic's own brand of the Greek style deities. Mm -hmm. A big key about this world, and I don't want to spoil too much, right, right, uh, but is that belief is very powerful mm -hmm. on this world. And so, in with, with the gods, the whole deal about the devotion mechanic is mm -hmm. it, it, it's almost as if the ability to the, the worship of the god is what brings the god into being. You can see that on the card. You know, you need a devotion of five for the god to come around. So he kind of needs his followers, huh. right? And so that, that's kind of, we knew that we wanted to key a lot of uh, uh, the gods kind of coming into being off of devotion somehow. Sure. We knew that. Um, so, so they went through iterations. Originally, they were really expensive, but they, they got cost reduction for your devotion so they, they could come out earlier. Yeah, so it costs one less for the, your devotion to white or whatever. Exactly. Sure. We didn't like that, though, because then you just have this file with all these, like, eight and nine mana spells. You look at that in the pack, you're like, whatever, I'm never casting this. Right. So we wanted to make them to where you could cast <coughs> them early, and we wanted it to just do something exciting that we'd never really seen before. Mm -hmm. So we knew if these cards required a tremendous board presence, that you could you know, kind of give them ridiculous stats. Indestructible was an awesome word to put on them because they're right. gods, so like they, they literally can't die. Super resonant, absolutely. Exactly, we didn't want your, you know, your super exciting, awesome mythic to just get hit with a disenchant, whatever. Right. So th that's kind of why that was there. The reason that they have this like static ability, activated ability thing, or at least uh, I, I, I guess all of them have that. Yeah, all of them have some sort of ability, even if they don't make creatures or whatever, like Nylea pumps them and right. black draws cards and red pumps the team and all that good stuff. Yeah, and, and that's because we didn't want to just say like, oh, believe us, these are enchantment creatures. <laughs> you know, they, we wanted them to feel like enchantments and have enchantment-like effects. So, mm. you know, I mean, you take a card like Mobilization, Right. That card gives your soldiers vigilance and makes guys. So this is kind of a riff off that, right. except it's you know a, a slightly different to feel unique. And, right. and a little then more man becomes a guy. guy. Right, <laughs> super huge, can sort of accidentally five you in the face. Exactly. Absolutely. And uh, you know, even with this, uh, I had two Heliots, so sometimes you can attack for five and just play your second copy and have it back to block. Uh, this guy. If you're a professional. Uh, yes, of course, of course. So anyway, that's kind of, we want, with the gods range in cost from, I guess, what, three to five? Correct. Is that right? So, you know, they're low enough mana cost that you're going to be casting these, they're going to have an impact on the game, but it's going to take a lot longer or a lot more effort right. to get them into the red zone themselves. I think they're just three to four, aren't they? There's the four for the for Erebos. And then Nylea is four, four, and then Perforos is four, and oh, okay. Thassa's so, three. So Thassa's three, right. and the rest of them are And that four. was, you know, I think a really cool as well. Like, it's, it's one thing to reduce the costs based on your devotion, mm -hmm. but when you turned it around and made the devotion turn them into creatures, that allowed you to really have under-costed creatures, right. when in actuality it was like a really interesting enchantment that just so happened to be a creature. Totally. It kind of works both ways. These cards are super exciting. The players absolutely love them, particularly in terms of uh, you know people who are buying cards. They love these things. They they have what I would describe as the planeswalker effect. Yeah. And that yeah. they're so cool, so different, so new. Everyone's like, have to have them all yeah. the time. Doesn't matter if they're good and constructed. I don't care. They're super cool. I want them in my decks, and that's great. <laughs> the fact that they're like commander generals, I think, is amazing. Oh, it's so awesome. Like it's just super cool all the way around. I think Heliod's amazing. He's no Perforos, oh, which we'll talk that's about a real later. One. But, but Heliod is really, really good, and the more that I've, I've seen him, and particularly played against him via Zach here as he smashed me with the guy, <laughs> like this is a real card, Inconstructed, yeah. it's terrific. All right, so, 100-handed one. 
best Siege Mastodon of yeah. all time. I'm going to let you finish. <laughs> but this is the best Siege Mastodon of all time. It is. Like, this to me was just like, it was like, whoa, we have cranked on two white yeah. and two colorless. Yeah. I haven't seen a two white, two colorless guy this good since Hero of Bladehold. I was like, that's real. That's a real comparison. Like, wow. Like, tell me about this guy. Well, it's, it's amazing what vigilance can do. You know, vi vigilance it really is, kind is. Of a form of card advantage. It means you get a, both an attacker and a blocker. Right. So it's, it's kind of like, it, this is a really loose stretch, but it is a good way of thinking about it. It kind of gives all your creatures the stang ability. <laughs> so it's like, okay, if one of them dies, they both die. Right. But in exchange, one of them can attack and the other one can kind of ha stay back to block. So. Vigilance, I think, is actually very underrated on sizable creatures. It really is. People don't give that ability like any credence at all. It's like you might as well have just put like nothing on there. Yeah. A lot right. of people feel that way. Right. When in actuality, like being able to attack and then block, because I mean, a, a four mana three five is going to be able to block almost all one, two, and three cost guys. Right. And a lot of four mana creatures as well. Right. Uh, this card in particular was a pet card of uh, designer, a great designer search winner, Ethan Fleischer. Mm. Uh, he, he did a deep dive into Greek mythology and found this mythological being called the Hecaton Kyrae, which are basically these titans. Mm -hmm. And one of them had a hundred hands. Huh. And so it, it, we put it in the file. Originally it was more expensive <laughs> and we tweaked it at rare, but uh, we, we thought it'd be funny to do that can block 99 creatures. That's so good. Which is awesome. That's right? so good. And we, we wanted like white to be able to do some monstrous stuff, so it made sense that it was a giant. Mm -hmm. The card was just mega flavorful and it, it, you know, it fit with the set. It was cool, and yeah. it had been around a while. It's awesome. The ability to put the words 99 on yeah. anything in Magic is awesome. When, and you were talking about complexity. Yeah. And one of the things we really try to do with the set, we know this is a complex set. Right. We want to imbue it with as much flavor as we possibly can, because the more you intuitively understand something and can put the picture together, right. the less the sort of overt complexity of the words actually affects your experience. Right. So we're looking for opportunities to have these like really flavorful, really evocative creatures and cards mm -hmm. so that you know you could kind of get over the fact that the words were really hard to digest. Sure. And I, I hope that has been successful. I, I think so. And of course, I mean, you know, it's, it's hard for me to always to do that stuff because I'm you know, I've been playing forever, right. I'm used to this stuff, I want my cards to be complex because that gives me yeah. the most interesting situations, so on and so forth. But I also like the fact that even if they're complex, if they make sense, if right. they resonate from that top down, oh, it's a really big guy who has who grows a hundred hands when I put all this mana into no, him. Uh -huh. I get it. I get it. I don't need to read all those words. I get it. He's just got a million hands gonna block everybody. There's literally not enough blockers you or not enough attackers <laughs> you could ever have that I'm ever worried about not blocking them at that point. Super awesome card. I love it. Uh, Soldier of the Pantheon. This is a card that I chose to discuss because it felt like a developer's card. Yeah, it is. Can you tell me, sort of, you know, and, and to explain what a developer's card is, essentially? Yeah, so there's a lot of cards that come out of development late in the cycle that mm -hmm. are really kind of cards that you build because of the context of the environment. Mm -hmm. So not everything, you know, sets don't just exist in isolation. They aren't just kind of in a magical... It'd be way Christmas easier if they did, though. would be very easy. <laughs> <laughs> We'd get to go home from work a lot earlier. Exactly. Uh, if that's the way they work. But yeah, every once in a while you want cards that explicitly shake up the format. The way you usually do this is... You put cards in the big October set mm -hmm. that are really good against the previous year's cards to put mm -hmm. some pressure on the environment to change. Sure. And then when time rolls around and like, you know, for Magic 2014, it's like Zathra Necromancer, you put mm. some cards that make Innistrad cards really good because right. those are about to rotate out. So right. you juice those up so that they aren't going to make the environment bad for a really long time, right? right. Environment overpowered. For right, or, or yeah, sort of like the very tip top of the power curve. Exactly. As powerful as that deck could have possibly have been for like two, three months, and then it just essentially goes and you away. just let it go away. Right. So what Soldier of the Pantheon's doing, it, it's, it's obviously a really uninteresting situation. Mm -hmm. If like the new set comes out, you're supposed to be really excited about the new cards, not the Ravnica cards you've been playing with for a year already. Right. And then all the good decks are just all the good Ravnica block decks. Right. Because there's been three sets of Ravnica block and only one set of the new sets, cards and mechanics. Right. So that's always going to be true to an extent, but you want to make some cards that are like explicitly punish you mm -hmm. if all you're doing is just playing the stuff that was good last year. Right. So Soldier of the Pantheon, Ravnica, obviously a multicolored set, mm -hmm. has hybrid cards, just a lot of gold effects. Right. 
And Swords of the Pantheon is incredible against all of that. <laughs> Pretty much. And, you know, totally unreal. I mean, it, you know, it, right. it doesn't matter how much it costs. It doesn't matter how big it is. If it's gold, this card can block it and, and interact with it profitably. Right. So what this says is, okay, you're going to need to work a little bit harder hmm. to, you know, and, and, and react to this card if you're going to work around it. Now, in practice, of course, you can always just shock it. Of course, you can always Mizium mortars it. It's not like supposed to be a brick wall to the entire set. Right, you don't want to just make the anti this entire block, you know, exactly. hard, but you want something that's very good against it. You just want to pressure people a little bit more to do what they may not necessarily already be doing. It's it's funny to me because like I think protection from multicolored would have been enough in some ways. <laughs> but then there's that extra like get you with like whenever they cast a multicolored spell you also get some advantage. Well, too. and I, uh, I know one of the frustrating decks that, that people, especially when it first came out, were really annoyed with were the, the like Naya Blitz decks or mm -hmm. the, the Burning Tree Emissary decks. Sure. Oh, um, yeah, those decks turned out not to be too overpowered, but when they're good, they're very good. They were very good for some time. Oh, yeah. And like this card is particularly good against those decks. It is pretty like, good against Burning like, Tree, you know, whatever decks. Right. It yep. blocks and trades with that. It's good even against uh, Lotla Troll, Dragscape Zombie. Mm -hmm. It, you know, the life matters more and faster matchups right. when you're racing. So I, I think this card, if it was directed against anything in particular, mm. was probably uh, those kinds of decks. Sure. Super cool. Best of lines of all time. <laughs> Absolutely going to my cube. Super cool card. Now, Biden of Thassa. Tell me about Biden of Thassa. You love a Coastal Pirate. Yeah, so my first major PTQ season, I played in Urza Saga PTQs. I ended up winning the first one I played in because my opponent drew down 19 or drew 19 cards with Yogg Moss Wagon on the first turn of the game. And I went Land Shower of Sparks on his Scourge Familiar. <laughs> it was very hard back then to right. win PTQs. Right, right. But I, my, my second major season I tried to qualify for was, uh, was Mercadian Mass Block. Mm -hmm. And one of the decks from that format was a Blue Skies deck that was just a bunch of awful blue flying creatures and uh, free counter spells, which are not awful. Yeah, this was Mercadian Masks. It was Mercadian Masks, so you had Thwart Foil Days. Right. And so Curiosity or uh, Coastal Piracy was incredible because you just attack, and even though you'd only deal like three damage, you'd like draw two or three cards every turn and just do that. So I have a soft spot in, spot in my heart for Coastal Piracy. Mm -hmm. Biden of Thassa is basically just upside Coastal Piracy. Pretty and, much. And in a format where creatures were a lot better than Cloud Skate, <laughs> a lot better than Cloud Sprite. Right, right. So, you know, I, I think this is a really exciting effect to bring back. And you can't underestimate making your opponents attack. I mean, it's you know, it's really expensive. It's you know, a lot of the time they're going to want to attack you anyway. But sometimes they're not. Right. And it's the times that they're not that the ability is incredibly interesting. It gives you all the control. Exactly. Right. Right. So Goblin Diplomats was an M14. Uh, me and Brad got a big kick out of that one. <laughs> the picture's amazing. You know. Great piece. Yeah. Of yeah. Pointing at the Goblin Buzz is ridiculous. <laughs> I love it. Um, didn't ultimately get constructed, but but I think it's interesting in that a it went from a red ability to a blue ability yeah. here, but also sort of with an upside, you know. Well, uh, yeah, and the the blue ability, you know, originally Sirens Call was the original thing that did that. You see an island in the background of this card, Sirens, right. Greek mythological cards. So you know, it makes sense for that ability to work in this context. Right. And obviously, it's really powerful in concert with Coastal Piracy. They have to tap all their creatures, right? So wherein you, can get you then draw a bunch of cards. Right. So. It's a neat synergy. I mean, I, I think the bigger conversation to have about these cards was they used to be totally different. Hmm. Uh, there's the cycle of cards that are kind of the gods' weapons mm -hmm. that used to be what we call snap-on equipment. Hmm. So they worked like both auras and equipment. When you played them, it attached to your creature. Right. But you could also move them around like equipment. Cool. So you get, you know, a big thing about we didn't want to just slap enchantment on permanent. You wanted all of the things that said enchantment to feel like both an enchantment and whatever they were. Right. The downside with that was legendary equipment enchantment dash artifact aura did not... <laughs> will not fit. <laughs> or legendary, uh, I guess, yeah, uh, legendary equipment aura, cham legendary enchantment equipment artifact. Equipment, chant. Yeah, you, you ran cool out. Equipment aura. Yeah, way too much, <laughs> way too many words. So I was like, let's take legendary off the card. But then creative, rightly, is like, these are supposed to be a big deal. So we couldn't quite get, you know, then it's like, okay, maybe we don't call them auras and just call them equipment. But that, like, felt kind of weird. And I still don't think the room was right. So we kind of ended up totally redesigning these. Mm -hmm. The deal with them now is that we just want them to feel like both an artifact and an enchantment. 
-hmm. The thing about artifacts is they have activated abilities. The thing about enchantment is they have static abilities. So these are both uh, artifacts and enchantments. They have both activated and static abilities, and they work well with each other. The cool. other thing being they trigger your devotion. Um, that said, they're kind of weird cards. They are very weird. I this is this was the first thing spoiled from the set. Really? Yes. They randomly <laughs> put this, and this was cute. Like I like I like how Wizards is, gets more and more clever on how they accidentally spoil ah. things. This was accidentally spoiled by printing it at like this size <laughs> on the bottom of an F and M poster. Really? Yes. And someone takes a picture of it. And like the push pin is like like you know this big and the. Cards like this big, and you're like, how big is this picture? Like, you are totally faking it. They're not gonna do legendary enchantment artifacts that just take the Goblin Diplomat's ability and put it on a blue card. Like, you are crazy. This is so fake. Obviously real. <laughs> yeah, real and, and I think these are pretty cool. I mean, they're they're definitely very different. Right. They're, you know, but and, and like if you just read them, they're kind of like, eh. but like once you start playing with them, I think they're actually pretty fun. I think they're pretty evocative. Right. And uh, and they're, this one is I, insane. This is a pet card of mine. Yeah, this is insane limited. Oh my goodness. <laughs> my God, my opponent he played it against me, and then he hit me with those two flyers and drew two cards, and that was the game. Yeah, I was mean, gonna, that sounds really weak. Yeah, it didn't yeah. end immediately, but. I was done. It uh, was all over but the crying at that point because he had such card advantage. Next turn he could get through with at least one guy and draw extra cards, and he kind of sort of can't get around it at that point. Um, he didn't even need the second ability. He's yeah, like, I was yeah. going to say. He's like, whatever. I'm just going to keep drawing cards and crush your face. <laughs> like, it worked out. Card is sweet. Curse of the Swine, a.k.a. Baconator. Baconator. The, the Baconator. I like, I like it. Um, so, yeah, tell me about where in the world this card comes from, developing this card. Yeah, so th this is based on the myth, I believe it's of Circe and Odysseus. It's mm -hmm. th there's actually two different myths about island enchantresses who turn people into pigs. Okay. I think this is about Circe. The idea being, uh, the myth is that all these soldiers go to this island, they, like, gorge, on, you know, they drink a lot, they eat a lot. And um, the, the Enchantress wants to keep Odysseus there forever. So she just like turns all of his crew to pigs and says, like, you can't leave. Mm -hmm. So it's a cool story. It's kind of evocative. It and cool. it fits the blue component of the color pie, which is polymorphing things and right. shape-changing things. So the idea behind this is that it, you know, pigify, turn a bunch of things to pigs. <laughs> um, the original design cost three UU, and it turned N things into pigs, where N was your devotion to blue. Ah. Eventually, we decided we didn't want blue to be a uh, devotion color, hmm. so th we changed this card to just be X blue blue because we thought it was very top down resonant and right. fit with blue's flavor. It was a cool card. It is cool. It, it also like you know it's a thing that blue doesn't get a lot, which is kind of a weird form of spot removal, so we thought it'd be interesting to do something in that space with potential constructed applications. Yeah, the, the, um, when you see blue blue X and the first line is exile X target creatures, you're yeah. like, <laughs> you're like, what is happening yeah. here? <laughs> oh my god! Now it's not great against the super fast aggro starts. Now we, we talked about this a little right. bit in the set review, like you know when they play, you know, Soldier of the Pantheon into whatever, into two two, into three three, into yeah. whatever. And then you're like, okay, I'm gonna get rid of your two one, your two two for two two. Wait, yeah. <laughs> I feel sad. Oh. Not not quite the right space for right. it, but it certainly is powerful in that way. Oh, it's good against your Olivia Voldarens. It's good against your Stormbreath Dragons. I mean, just basically the bigger creatures that you're hitting with this, right. the fine, the more fine you are with them having some 2-2 green boars. Exactly. Which has like the best token art ever. Oh, it's actually it. my favorite token art. It's, yeah, it's completely so unreal. Best token art ever. I love it. Master of Waves, I don't think you were around for that when you I mentioned it. I was not around for that. But it's the weirdest thing I've ever seen. I can't even... I can't, I just don't. What is happening on this card? Yeah. Why does it have protection from red? I don't know. Oh, no, 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 no. Come no, on, give come it on. to the, me. The protection give it to of me. red's the easy part. All, All right, right, what's the easy part? Show me. How do you deal with fire? The water. Oh. Okay. Oh, okay. he's the master of waves. He's not the subordinate of waves. He's not the middle manager of waves. <laughs> the middle manager of waves. He does not waves. care about your fiery thing. <laughs> protection from red twice yeah, on two Sundays. Red. Yeah. Eat it. Yeah, well, yeah. This guy is not getting roasted by anything. He's standing in the middle of the ocean. He's got his water horses. He's, he's, he's doing he's, things. <laughs> Creature dash water horse. He makes horse. one zeros. Weird. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I mean, I was not around for this card, and when I read it, I'm like, huh? Yeah. But, huh? It, but again, it, this is an example, I think, of a card that works because when you, like, get it, mm -hmm. it's a really cool story. It's like 
the waves, you know, what is it? A wave doesn't stay around forever. It crests and then it goes away. So right. he summons forth his things and they're not going to be around forever. Whenever he pieces <laughs> out, they're done. Um, I think it's cool. You know, the Pro Red is cool. It has some added value against Red, which I think is going to be really good in standard. Sure. It, you know, you can put it in decks with other elementals and right. older formats. I want to either vial this in in Legacy. Yeah, Absolutely. Right. I want to have a Lord of Atlantis and another, you know, Lord of Atlantis to match with a Pearl Trident, and then I want to put this guy in, have 10 power worth of guys oh, yeah. all of a sudden. And even in modern, right, where like a lot of the premier removal is red, right. it's uh, clearly a very powerful effect. Right. So, I mean, clearly, you know, it's a merfolk, obviously, with eternal considerations <laughs> in mind. Sure. But I also think it's, uh, you know, the Tritons are uh, kind of Theros' version of merfolk. Mm -hmm. In Greek mythology, there were races of sea people, although it's unclear kind of what they looked like. Right, if it was just like merfolk or not, or like mermaid type things, yeah. or if it was sort of Triton type creatures or whatever. Whatever. Lost denizens of Atlantis. Or yes, obviously the octopuses and things. You know, like the krakens, <laughs> them, them, them krakens. Which is which is not Greek, yes. apparently. But, but this to me is like it's mythic and it's so weird. It's, weird. it's just weird. I mean, like, and that's part of why it's interesting is that it's right. just completely unlike anything you've ever seen. Oh, I mean, it's pretty good with the. Uh, with the uh, Biden of Thassa that we just looked yeah, at. Yeah, that's true. Probably a lot of cards. Like three guys. guys. But yeah, I, th I think it's like definitely a kind of tricky card. Um, it's a very developed card again. Yeah. But I, I also like um, more constructed viable devotion cards. Um, blue, typically not a color where you are trying to just vomit permanence on the battlefield. Right, particularly blue, yeah, with, uh, ones with lots of blue in their mana cost. Even this only has one only blue has in one mana. its mana cost. Exactly. Right, and so I, I like the idea of pushing a clearly tournament playable card mm -hmm. to incentivize a kind of behavior that the color's not traditionally used to. Mm. Because what you wouldn't want at all is for one of your core mechanics that's going to exist on all your five cards, uh, all your five gods, mm -hmm. to just be something that you can't do yeah. just because one color is sort of not naturally inclined to do it. So I respect sure. what this card is trying to do. The card is super weird, is weird and neat. Now here's here's the god of the sea. Yeah. Here's here's Thassa. She's neat. I, she, she's really interesting to me. Yeah, just because of what you'd mentioned. Like it's hard to get devotion to blue to work. I mean, if you wanted to reprint a Vendelion click, I'd be okay. I'd be <laughs> totally okay with that. That wasn't like one of the best creatures of all time well, or anything. Well, we printed Livebane Zombie, which is kind of close. Livebane is sick. Uh, that card is wow. Oh yeah, that card's real good. Woo! You know, so with Thassa, I mean, I think again, this is an example of like, okay, blue not traditionally good at devotion, so mm -hmm. let's make this cheaper. Right. Let's have a, you know, scrying one every turn is a really good effect. It is. So let's try to see if we can encourage that play pattern. Right. Um, it's really hard to say how good Thassa is because it's so dissimilar to anything Blue has ever done before. Right. But, I mean, you look at the combination of abilities, I mean, making things unblockable, not anything to sneeze at, especially since she can target herself if she's active, and Which five points of damage is a lot. Right. Um, a thing that blue decks traditionally have trouble with is stopping large creatures on the ground once they're there. Mm -hmm. She does a great job of that. Absolutely, if she's turned on for sure. You know, the, the idea was, uh, or at least what I saw was uh, was Think Tank as a card. That's a card from Odyssey Block. Yeah. And it was a blue and two colorless. At the beginning of your upkeep, you look at the top card, you can put it in your graveyard if you want. Sort of like Scry. But then you said, well, that's not accidentally a 5-5. Five five. Right. And then it's not accidentally giving all your creatures unblockability. This card is insanely good and limited, by the way. <laughs> Ridiculous. Because I'm like, okay, the only way I can win is if he, oh, he remembered the ability. <laughs> That happened earlier. Um, yeah, so, because, you know, sometimes people just don't pay attention oh, to these yeah. abilities on the cards yeah, that they yeah. have, and particularly I, in pre-releases. I've won some games with, uh, what is it, Zephyr Flight? Mm -hmm. The exact same way. Oh, yeah, you can make your 4-4 four, four fly and block my guy. Oh, Oops. Well, sad. Lose. <laughs> but Thass is really interesting. I thought that, you know, her, she is the cheapest god, at least currently, and I think, uh, I think, you know, it's a really cool design. Interesting templating decision of can't be blocked versus is unblockable. Yeah. I if that's something we're going to see more of. They got rid of unblockable as a keyword or whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. as like a, as a term, ah. because it wasn't intuitive. It was much like indestructible. Ah. Now uh, indestructible is officially a keyword or something. The scenario was I play Boros Charm and then I play a creature. I play Boros Charm to make my guys indestructible. Ah. Then I play a creature. 
Oh yeah. Is that guy indestructible? I assume that it is, but I that's not my well, I before the rules uh -huh. change, he he was indestructible. He was, but now is now not. he's not because it's giving indestructibility uh -huh. to the guys on the battlefield and then you play another guy and he wasn't around to get that ability, so it's not indestructible. And so unblockability was in that same space uh, of all your all weird. your creatures that turn are unblockable and then you play the haste guy is it's he like, unblockable? Is it, yeah, sure. Kind of sometimes, yeah, sort of, not really, whatever. <laughs> now they just use can't be blocked. There's, there's no like ambiguity. I appreciated that. And that's where that's, that's come from. Everyone I was watching those back at Wizards knows that templating and rules are not my strong points. Absolutely. So, uh, Fair I, enough. I will freely admit that. Sure. Um, and, and as tournament players, we really care about all that <laughs> stuff. We really care about the order of things happening and they go on the stack. And what's this word versus that word? Here's Erebos, yep. God of the Dead. He's neat. He's a 5'7. He's the uh, biggest butt of them all, <laughs> as it were. Uh, I also like how every single god can be answered by Celestia Charm. That, that yeah. cracks me up a little bit, yeah. you know, just exile oh, him out of here. Oh, you guys a creature now? Sorry. Yeah, woo, bye. So, it's not a creature until it has devotion. However, Celestia Charm can't answer it once it gets to that point. Um, but, tell me a little bit about Erebos. Yeah, so Erebos, uh, one of the things, the power and toughness, obviously seven toughness doesn't matter a lot, mm -hmm. but a thing that we're trying to do with black is to give its creatures more toughness to differentiate its play style a little bit more from red. Hmm. For a long time, black had like a lot higher offense than defense. Right. But if you think, of it, like A, that doesn't make a lot of sense because, you know, black, not an incredibly aggressive color, but it is, you know, with skeletons and zombies, uh, vampires have regenerated. A lot of its sort of signature creatures, mm -hmm. skeletons, sure. are known for being resilient and coming back over and over again. So we right. thought like, okay, and then, you know, black tends to have the most removal unlimited, red is comparable. So if they're both aggressive and they both have a lot of removal, it's a really They're similar place. Kind of the same thing. Yeah, yeah. So what we tried to do was shift a lot more toughness to black, give black a little bit more of a long game, play a little bit more of the resource exchange. We wanted the gods to really feel like their colors. Mm. So we decided to sort of make it a 5-7 and just sort of make that a lot louder that this is a thing that we're doing. Now, your opponents can't gain life feels very much like in a, a developer decision to hose Sphinx's revelation. I mean, sort of. At the same time, like, what you want to do to hose Sphinx's revelation is not necessarily, like, play a four mana card that doesn't affect the board. Sure. I mean, it does compete because it lets you dr uh, draw cards. It stops them from gaining life. I think that's some of it. I also think this is pretty thematic of an ability. Mm. I mean, it makes, it blends well with the green ability of paying life to draw cards. Mm -hmm. I think it is just sort of good in the format with a lot of lifelink, which the set does because of the auras. Mm -hmm. I, I think it just is kind of a generally sensible thematic ability with some upside splash damage against Sphinx's revelation. Mm -hmm. uh, it just makes sense to me that the, a god of the dead is not gonna be all about people gaining life. <laughs> He's like, nah, dog, we're, come back to my world. Right, right, right. They so, ain't no life gaining over here. I, I think it's probably a combination of Yeah, I was going to say, because it doesn't say players can't gain life. Right. Just right. everybody is else. Is this y'all? Because <laughs> uh, black is in this setting, you know, the underworld is characterized by these like gold masks. Uh -huh. And the idea is, you know, you've got all this money, this traditional wealth, you can't do anything with it because you're in the underworld. That comes right. from the idea that people used to be buried with like gold coins and possessions sure. to accompany them, but it just doesn't matter because the underworld is the underworld and it sucks. Right. So got uh, all this money and can't spend it. Exactly. Which fits in the way we sort of characterize that black being the color of selfishness, avarice, and greed. Mm -hmm. Literally putting the card greed, uh, or the, the greed ability right. on this card, paying two life to draw a card, I think really drives that home. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, black is all about power at any cost. And I think that's really thematic with uh, what, what's going on with this kind of character. Sure. So. Super cool card. I like it a lot. I like it a lot. Great Merchant of Asphodel. If there was a common <laughs> that I was not <laughs> expecting to be like an absolute all star, like when I first saw it, I was like, wow, that looks good. And then I got to play with it today, and I killed multiple people, including Zach, yeah. with it. And I was like, what are you at again? Oh, yeah, kill you. Out like, of nowhere, too. It was just like <laughs> four, six. Yeah, because you have like a bunch of blockers. Yeah. I got a bunch of guys with kind of a stalemate. And I was like, wait a minute. You're yeah. dead. Like, that's it. Tell me about the Gray Merchant. Yeah, uh, this card was basically an effort to, we, we knew we wanted green, or uh, originally we wanted black primarily, 
in green secondarily to be the devotion colors because mm. they're uh, green is the most permanent intensive color mm. uh, at least in terms of larger permanence sure. white as you know so more littler littler creatures mm -hmm. black tends to be the color that's more like more black more black more black right. which made sense for it to be devoted originally there the devo devotion was just not doing a lot in limited mm -hmm. and so we put the one three at common that coercions them this card at common that you know has a very substantial dra drain effect with a reasonable body, Seriously. and those two cards curve into each other and are really good. Yeah. Right. So if I'm going to coercion you and then soul feast you with a two four, that's not too bad. So these were these were part of our efforts to really make devotion something that you saw a lot of and mattered a lot in limited. Right. Now, did you want to push Devotion and Construct it? Because I, I seriously feel this guy's going to be in Construct. Yeah, I, I mean, I think this card is definitely playable in the con. And there's a lot of ways to pay life to draw cards in Standard right now. We right. just saw Erebos, God of the Dead. There's, uh, Underworld Connections Underworld are in connections, there. Underworld Read the Bones. Bones, I think, is one of those cards. So, yep. I mean, you know, it, uh, the other, like a 2 4 in, for Constructed is like between a 2 and a 3 mana card. You're going to want to get like a Soul Feast worth of damage out of it. But I do think, especially mono black decks, if those turn out to be a thing, are looking for ways to get their life total back. Mm -hmm. And with things like Dark Prophecy, that you can, you know, it does something, but also just provides three devotion. It's really easy to have huge swings with this card. Seriously, so. we're talking five to seven, even more life that just goes like back and forth. I mean, you know, you drain for seven and you gain seven, it's a 14 point life swing from the common. You know, I actually right. think this is going to be really good in Popper. Uh, in mono black aggro and popper, I'm just actually really excited about that. But one thing you'd mentioned was mono black control or yeah. or mono black anything, really. Yeah. And <laughs> it's always like it's always like the dream. I don't get it. Like ever since torment, yeah, uh -huh. it's always been like when's the next mono black anything? Like <laughs> people have tried it before. My God, I tried it back and I think it was like Morning Tide Standard with Miri the Cursed. Oh, you remember that nice, one? Nice deck. And yeah. yeah, yeah, that was a fun deck. And it was like I was using Moonglove Extract so I could kill the things that pro black or whatever. It was really ridiculous. Powerful. Powerful. Yeah. Powerful. <laughs> and uh, but it's always just like, can mono black work this time? Can mono black get there this time? Does development paying attention to that? Is there a is there some sort of contingent that is like we want to make mono black a thing if it can do it? I, I mean, we, look, we know people get excited about this idea of this mono black. Deck. <laughs> We really right? do. And, and it's never so bad that you just like can't try it. Right. On the other hand, like it's really a pretty uninteresting play pattern when it works. Right. This is just like kill every one of your things, draw some more cards eventually right. in some fashion, like make you discard cards directly from your enemy that I can't interact with. So like you, there's a cap on how good that kind of deck can be. Right. So, but you know we want to encourage the possibilities. Something sure. people get excited about, and there are decks. I mean, Mo like Conley played it to I think a top 32 finish in a pro tour. It may have even been a top 16 finish. Mm. So I mean, it's not as though the cards aren't there. Sure. Um, and so I think it's it's kind of like around the sort of tier two viability that it's good for something like that. Too. Yeah. It, it always just it always felt like. You know, it, it's always very close. Yeah. You know, and but you always kind of want it close, but not there. Right. Because, like you said, when you get there, you want it, but then when you have it, you're yeah. like, "This is you're really like, yeah, annoying." Did we really enjoy this. I'm really tired of getting drain light for ten from this guy. Like, is there something else we could be doing <laughs> that's fun? You know, like the reason that mutilate left when all this other stuff come in, I think is a very good thing. Right. You know, and people are just like, "Well, if it just had a wrath, and it'd be blah blah blah." Well, yeah, if it just had a wrath, it'd just be the best thing you would do, and. Who wants that all the time? Uh, and a lot of the deck, because, like, you know, I talked about, one of Black's things is, like, play more Black cards. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, that means that the build is pretty scripted, right? You're right. like, oh, I'm going to play all these Corrupts. Then I'm going to play all these uh, other cards and maybe want to play more Swamps and Corrupts. Right. And then it's just like, okay, well, like, your deck is kind of built for you. Right. That is not the worst thing ever, but you don't want that to be too good. You don't want the thing that you just determine, like, within five minutes of looking at the spoiler right. to just be the best deck. You're like, oh, no, figure it out. You know, that's really boring. Magic's about discovery and change and evolution. Right. So again, that makes you want to put cards like that or decks like Mono Black kind of in like solidly tier two range. All right. You don't want it to be the best thing. You just want it to be something good. People can get excited exactly. about it. They can feel like they discovered something, but they didn't discover like they didn't break the format with it. Exactly. I don't want to ever break the format with it. So Read the Bones is next. You talked about it just a little bit. Tell me about Read the Bones. I think this card is real good. Uh, I thought for C was really good. 
this guy, you know, scry four, then draw two. Very That's different so than scry good. two, draw two. But three is also very different from two. Um, I, you know, like sign in blood, I always thought was a really underplayed card. Like and just getting ahead on cards for two mana is unbelievable. Right, and like right at the end of the, I mean, you know, sort of now, right mm -hmm. before Theros is a thing, uh, sign in blood's actually gotten a lot of play these days. Yeah, it has. So people finally sort of recognize, like, hey, really good card draw, and Being you're about plus to one lose card it. Is, yeah, is nice. Exactly. So yeah, I, I'm really excited about read the bones. I think it's it's a clear. I mean, it's riskier against aggro. I think there are a lot of really good aggro decks than right. something like Divination. But I think Divination is actually really good now. Um, so I, I, I think Read the Bones allows for non-blue control decks mm -hmm. in a way that uh, we haven't seen in a really long time because it's meaningful filtering plus raw card advantage. Right. I also think it might even provide incentives to you know for your blue decks to go a direction other than Sphinx's Revelation. Now that said, this is a great card to play with Sphinx's Revelation. Of course it is. Everything's uh, better to play with Sphinx's <laughs> Revelation. Yeah, but it's it's definitely but, one of those where, you know, you saw Read the Bones, again, the Model Black talk sort of sort of kicks up again yeah. because it really needs that selection. A lot of times Model Black can kind of run out of gas. How's it supposed to refuel? Well, you have Sign of Blood, you don't have Sign of Blood, you actually get sort of more or less an upgrade. It costs one right. more, but you're seeing a lot more cards potentially. So there's there's a lot of play in this one. Uh, yeah, and the thing that I like seeing, and I, I don't know how conscious of an effort this is, but it's something we talked about for a long time. You don't want blue to have just like the best card advantage and the best selection and the highest density of card drawing spells. Right. Right. So like you want to give like white and green ways of getting virtual card advantage on the board. Mm -hmm. You want to give red like cards like uh, a draw and discard right. like card selection. selection filtering. Right. And then I, I, the thing I like is like for blue to have a higher density of card drawing spells, mm -hmm. but then like black maybe having like the best one, but only one. <laughs> or something like right. that. Or like with all the Only life paying, you can't, you know, you, you can, ca I can cast eight divinations in a game and be happy about it. You can't cast eight of these. Right. So I like the idea of giving black, you know, one a really overtly powerful spell, mm -hmm. but something that you, you have to do a little bit more work for. Right. As opposed to just like, oh, I'm going to keep casting a bunch of these. Right, so, obviously, just keep running them. Yeah, I, I like what Read the Bones is doing. Right. Super cool spell, super flavorful. I love it. Rescue from the Underworld. So this card, I think, is Mark Rosewater's favorite card in the set. Mm. When we designed it in the meeting, all of us were just like, that is awesome, that is so <laughs> cool, it's sweet. It does a lot of really neat stuff, I think. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it can re-trigger, enter the battlefield's abilities. It, uh, you know, you yeah. can block and do stack tricks with it. You can counter spell removal with it, mm -hmm. um, while also just being incredibly thematic. So good. So it's I, dripping with flavor. It's dripping with flavor. It's got a great piece of art. Right. I, I just think this card is a a, a slam dunk yeah. for a huge variety of reasons, yeah. and uh, I'm really excited to see it. Uh, make it all it's all the way from the design pile to, to print. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's super sweet. It's one of those like with Chain to the Rocks, it's like right up there with like what are the core cards that you would show off from Theros to show yeah. like this is how we hit Greek mythology in the face. Yeah. Like so right. beautiful, so perfect, really powerful. Had it played against me earlier today in the pre-release oh, where the guy was like, I'm going to sack Abhorrent Overlord and then get back Abhorrent Overlord yeah. and Hythenia, <laughs> the huge Gorgon that yeah. destroys all the other non-Gorgon yeah. creatures. And I was like, uh oh, thanks. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> I'm dead now. It was less fun when I was doing this with Augers of Bolas. So. <laughs> I can only imagine. Now, the whip. Tell me about the whip. Damn. Yeah, uh, this is something you don't see a lot of, like recursive reanimation. Um, it's true. We like it. It's it's sort of you know it harkens back to corpse dance. Right. Um, it's obviously the two abilities have tremendous synergy with one another. Right. Because the more that you're smashing them upside the head and gain a lot of life, the less likely you are to die in a counter attack, which means that you can again smash them upside the head and gain a lot of life. Right. Um, so I, I think this card's really fun. I see a lot of people just like throwing one copy into decks, which to me is a sign of a successful card. Mm. You know, where people are just like, this looks cool. I want to see what it can do. This is awesome. Right. And uh, we don't see that much reanimate with haste. Now, there is a split card in Dragon's Maze that can do that. Right. Along with this, obviously, reanimating with haste. Far better than just reanimating, because right. you're less likely to get hit with a terror or something like that. So sure. I think there is some really intriguing stuff you can do. People think that reanimator kind of died once unburial rites left. I'm not so sure about that. I, I mean, think with rescue from the underworld, 
yep. and Whip of Erebos. Now, the thing that was interesting for me from Whip of Erebos, A, is that it's very powerful. However, you do have to sort of take into account you got to pay eight mana before it really does anything right. beyond lifelink, um, is there are two interactions that are incredibly important right now to standard. Mm -hmm. One is Obsidat, and the other is Aetherling. Yes. And both of them trump Whip's exile, you know, if it were to leave the battlefield, exile it forever. Right. That's like Obsidat essentially will work. And when Obsidat exiles at the, end of his, at the end of your turn, he will come back and drain two and gain yeah. two. You're like, if I'll you put use the whip, whip ability on the stack first. Right. Then do this other thing. Right. So you got to be able to stagger right. But for Aetherling, you know, it's just one blue exile and return it. Again, it trumps Whip of Erebos. And was that at all a consideration? I'm sure it was. Uh, that, like I said, these changed after I left. Um, ah. But, I mean, we knew Aetherling was very good. We knew. Ghost Castle was really good. Right. So I, I I would be floored if no one played them together. Sure. Particularly because the lifelink interaction is incredible with Etherling. Yeah. And like on the off chance that your Etherling died, being able to get it back is good. But if you're just like, oh, unblockable, by the way, eight. Like, it's <laughs> not really the easiest to right. race. And then I'll gain eight. Yeah. yeah you know, so and, not and, only that. And I was talking to Jerry earlier. He was excited about this card just because of the lifelink ability. Hmm. You know, I mean, there's a lot of just powerful between life gain, zombie, uh, between desecration demon. There's a lot of just really high powered black cards. Yeah, desecration demon in particular. Now, that was my spoiler for Return yeah, of Ravnica. Man. Yeah, I was like, this card is monstrous. I mean, it just like, now at the time when it was when it was spoiled, we were in the middle of like Lingering Souls dot deck, right. you know? Right. And Lingering Souls was working with Snapcaster Mage and there was Delver and then there was all the new Phyrexia stuff at the time and blah, blah, blah. And we were going into Indistrad and, or we were going into Return of Ravnica right. rather, and it was, you know, it was the, you know, well, you know, well, everyone's just going to be Lingering Souls and so it's not going to be that good. And I'm like, well, yeah. so you're going to make it a 7-7? Seven, seven yeah. And lose a guy? <laughs> Okay, like that's fine. Um, and now it's just sort of like become one of the premier black creatures in the format. Oh, and you, know, you see Willie Adel playing it in modern now. Yeah. I, I mean, the card is clearly absent. I remember seeing it in a file like three months after I had stopped really playing Return to Ravnica. We'd gone back and play tested uh, Innistrad block to make sure we understood what the rotation was going to do. Right. I just saw this card in the file. I was like, did we all read this? <laughs> Because <laughs> part of it's like, did they really give me like one of the best black aggro creatures ever? ever? Yeah, I said to Eric, I was like, is this new in the file? He's like, we've been in, this has been in the file for four months. Wow. I was like, I'm gonna start playing some decks with this. And, and I mean, it was. It turned out people had played it. And we're like, yeah, this is fine. It's really good, but it's not interesting to test because it's like it's just we know exactly what animal. the card does. Right. But yeah, the card's really good. The card is a big and monster. It, it works quite nicely with the whip too. Yeah. Play the de play the demon, then play the whip next turn. Gain six, or they'll make your guy a seven right, seven. Darn. Oh snap! Rough life. Yeah, really. Yeah, really hard. And then if you kill, they kill the demon. You bring it back. Yeah. Hit them for six. Gain six. Like that's a thing. Or they sack another guy. Yeah. I'm okay with that. You know, right. there's lots and lots of good options for the whip. Uh, it's really cool. I, I love all like all of these things. Uh, I didn't bring up Spear of Heliod, uh, at least in terms yeah. of bringing up the image, but. But it also works in that it's, you know, it's Glorious Anthem and right. it has sort of another ability sort of tacked on a little Which bit. I, I keep hearing people also say, like, I don't know how much this other ability is going to come up. It's going to come up a lot. <laughs> Your opponent's not going to not attack you right. when you have a Spear of Heliod out. I, 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 I was like very confused. I was like reading some article. I was like, well, okay, you have a Glorious Anthem, so all your little guys get huge. The downside of that is that you let them attack you back. <laughs> So I guess if you're abyssing them every time, yeah, it's not like incredible. You still take the damage. I was just right. like, why are we acting as though this is not a thing? Right, it's well, not going to come up. No, like, it's going to come up. I know a thing a that lot. has caused me to lose games in my aggro decks is I draw too many land. Right. So if instead I'm just nuking my opponent's creatures <laughs> instead of looking at them, right. I think uh, that is Seems probably better. pretty powerful. Yes, very, so. very good. Now, Ember Swallower is next. He's a big monstrous guy. Tell me about him. Tell me about I, the four mana four or five. Yeah, so it's four mana four or five clearly to get some monstrosity, a role it constructed. I also think like we knew it was going to be an intro pack rare because we wanted a monstrosity intro pack rare. Mm -hmm. You don't want it to be so expensive, it never happens. Right. I don't know this because at the time this card was like an uncommon, it cost a million mana and only blew up two lands. Right. Aaron Forsyth loves land destruction, <laughs> as do Mark Globus. Nice. Mark Globus is a producer in R&D. He's a lot of people's boss. Mm -hmm. I would be 
flabbergasted <laughs> if both of them didn't have something to do with the power level of this card. Right. I do not like pushed land destruction. This is definitely pushed land destruction. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to activate off something like a Nykthos Shrine of Nyx. Mm -hmm. Wildfire is very powerful. It is. Armageddoning is a lot better if you have a 7-8. Uh, so, uh, you look, it costs 7, it can get teared, but I'm just saying, if uh, <laughs> if you lose to this card and it's frustrating, send all complaints to Aaron Forsythe mm -hmm. on was Twitter. Yes, yeah. at MTG underscore Aaron. Yep. I, I I wash my hands of this card. That's <laughs> all I'm saying. Wow. <laughs> yeah, this is one of those cards that again, it's weird because it normally, at least traditionally in Magic, intro pack rares have been really bad. They've right. just not been that, I mean, you know, they're constructed. Well, they're that not really. That was Jet card, but that was a long yeah, time ago. Yeah, that was a thing. And that was sort of like almost a pre con type oh, deck. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes. That was right. a, that was a pre con. My fault. For me, the, you know, this is the intro pack that has the foil in the front. Oh, okay, and and yeah, rarely yeah. is that like a really great constructed card because, you know, you want the, the foil, you know, constructed all stars to be something that you have to get elsewhere, not just, you know, in the intro deck. But. This was one I was like, four mana, four or five, it's a lot. The monstrosity looks expensive, isn't actually that expensive, particularly with something like Nykthos to gain right. you a bunch of mana all at once. You know, it, it's not actually that hard to make the ability to go off. And then I played against this card, and this card is real, very real. Oh, yeah. I played with it, I played against it. That making people sack three lands when you are on, you know, you have all the advantage is huge. Yeah. And I mean, I will say a thing I like is a lot of, you know, your four mana red cards recently have been just hyper-aggressive cards like Hellrider, Hero of Oxidridge, Cough of, of the Hammer in many ways is kind of a Lava Hounds variant. Sure. I like the idea of a constructed playable card that isn't just like you're dead when I cast it. Right. You know, and it has enough toughness to be reasonably sticking around. Right. To play defense or to untap to, to be at the sort of that top of that really, you know, premier constructed curve. Yeah, or, yeah exactly. I mean, I could see like a red-green mid-range deck, sort of like a Kibler deck that's sure. not you know, the Burning Tree Emissary dump my hand kind of deck. Right. But that is, you know, using, like, this card works very well, as does a lot of Monstrous with uh, Gyre Sage. Mm -hmm. I think it's really interesting. Right. Um, again, we, we talked about Nykthos, just any mana accelerants at all. Right. You know, just giving you something to do with excess mana, if nothing else. So I, I would love it if this card could find its way into some green mid-range decks. Mm -hmm. I would not love it if it becomes <laughs> a format staple. Because, mm -hmm. you know... Because losing three lands, man. I like man. having mana. It's, cast spells. it's a kick in the butt, seriously. If your opponent has stumbled on mana and your Ember Swallower goes off, the game is basically done. Well, and that is a, a thing to bring up about the monstrosity mechanic. Yeah. I feel like you know, there's historically all these mechanics that we do a lot of research internally, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, creature lands, whether it's invokers, mm -hmm. whether it's kicker even. Mm -hmm. There's all these mechanics that look so overcosted relative to what they do. Right. And a lot of times players are just like, this is not good. I don't want to spend seven mana and do three damage. Just some symmetrical effect. By the time we have seven mana, why does blowing up lands matter? But the thing is, like, the opportunity cost of playing a four mana four five is just not high. <laughs> like, a four mana four five is really good. Right. So there are going to be some percentage of games where you're flooded out on mana and just have these incredible abilities. Right. So I think it's easy to look at monstrosity and just be like, whatever. Yeah, this is that's gonna never going to matter. We're never going to hit it. And yeah. what I saw, at least during the set review, as we started talking about all of them, was it was very similar. The the a lot of the a lot of the pattern was there'd be a mana cost, there'd be a monstrosity cost for two more than the than the current right. mana cost. That would be like super cool, crazy yeah. upside. You know, just for just for playing the creature. Yeah, I and mean, it was know, awesome. Like, how many times today have I gotten beaten down by an eight nine? <laughs> it's like, is this Rise of the Eldrazi? Oh, this is a common. Right. It's, and, and that adds to the monstrosity mythic flavor or whatever, too. The point being, I would not underestimate any of these monstrous cards. I think we're going to think they're better and better the more we play with them. Yeah, they're, they're a lot. I mean, it's a lot like Scavenge as well. Yeah. When Scavenge first came out, there was the, you know, oh, Scavenge is so expensive. This is right. ridiculous. Why is it even on the card? It's so expensive. And then <laughs> started playing, and we were like, oh, oh. wait. Like, have, free value just for playing this guy. Right. Oh, I have something, and my opponent has nothing. Mm -hmm. Something is way better than nothing. In <laughs> fact, it normally is. So, Fire Drinker Seder, this is the Jackal Pup. This yeah. is Jackal Pup with Upside. And I thought it was interesting that P. Sully, Patrick Sully, yeah. the one, the only, the, the master himself. Yes. Uh, I, I obviously love his opinion about all things red. You know, he can win a, a, a legacy open with Burn when <laughs> nobody no else, else on the planet nope. can. Oh. Um, but the one of the things he had mentioned in regards to this one is that. 
Jackalplot was really exciting and really format defining back in the day because there weren't a lot of aggro decks. Oh, of course. There was a ton of spell yeah. decks, a ton of counter spell decks, and Jackal Pups and its ilk and Iron Claw Orcs, of course, if we want to go way back, was the idea you sort of got under things. Yes. Nowadays, people are playing a lot more creatures back and forth, so it's not going to just be like this creature that's never going to get hit with something or never going to get blocked like, like Jackal Pup could be back in the day. Yeah. This is a card that is going to run into other creatures, but it now has the sort of not great fire breathing attached to it. Oh, yeah. I mean, and, and again, it's easy to look at this fire breathing and be like, that is awful. <laughs> but, like, and, and, and like, you sit there and you attack this into a Loxodon Smiter. You pay four mana, trade your guys for theirs, and you take four damage. Right. You're like, that's really bad. But, no, it's actually really good. Right. It allows your one mana guy to kill the Smiter. To the Loxodon Smiter. <laughs> as opposed to just sitting and looking at it, which exactly. is what it would have done beforehand. This card is wildly better than Jackal Pump. Oh, it, it is like it is very easy to be like, oh, it's kind of better than Jackal. It is a way better than Jackal. <laughs> right. uh, and that said, I think it's going to have a lot less impact on its format than Jackal Pop did. Sure. Just because of exactly what you just said. Right. Creatures are better these days. Creatures are better these days. It's a big deal. This guy can't really meaningfully block very well. It's a big deal. There's stuff like War Leaders Helix in the format, so right. the burn ability matters. Right. You can walk into it, but the fact that this card can trade with 3 threes, even at high cost, is huge. The fact that red aggro decks don't have to play, you know, Boundary Street Denizen or whatever really bad cards bad are playing cards, Legion yeah. World, it was awkward. Uh, or, or get to just play a critical density of them, right. is, uh, is, is incredibly meaningful. So sure. I mean, it's, it's important not to write a card like this off. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a really good card. Um, this is an example, again, of what we were talking about with like R&D really wanting to capacitize aggro decks in the aggressive colors. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, definitely pick up your fire drinker satyrs. <laughs> if you like building red aggro decks, <laughs> he is your man for the next year or two, yeah. for sure. He's very good. Now here, here we drop the hammer. Tell me, tell me about this big old hammer. <laughs> Evan earlier was not playing hammer in his deck at first. I wasn't. He was playing hammer. I just lost two consecutive games to it, and it was just nothing resembling close. It was insane. It was, it was totally bananas. Now, granted, I wasn't playing red at first, not so, playing, so it's yeah. not like I was playing red and I didn't play the hammer. Right, right. It was, I you wasn't playing colors. red, and I said, I don't know which these red cards. It seems like they have a bunch of big monsters, and they're scary, and I was going to go my Ember Swallower because I picked red, and this hammer seems really terrific and won the game by itself. Yeah, I mean, so, <laughs> so I put Fervor into M13 because I wanted to do kind of a plant for Gruul. I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. Fervor's not that great, but like, fire is really good. Right. Fires was a thing. Fervor's not that much worse than Fires. Easier to cast. Maybe we'll see if it'll do anything. Turns out it didn't do anything. Right. Uh, Hammer, though, it's, it, you know, again, it's marginal upside on cards. It's just very hard to overstate how valuable it is. Right. Right. And, uh, I yeah, like you know, I like how there's a lot of cards in red, particular. Yeah. The, the, the big dragon, the fire drinker yep. that we just looked at, that when you flood out, Really cool things can still happen. And, and that's exactly right. I mean, not every game of Magic goes like you want it to. Right. You can't think about the God Draw. So a Hammer, it, it looks like, okay, there's a Fire of like this marginal ability tacked onto it. The Sacrifice of Land ability is incredible. It's really good. It's so good. The <laughs> second you're at like five mana and you need to start doing stuff and you're hitting like three, then nine, or I mean three, then six, six. so nine, so... I mean, you're just going to be like, wow, how did I live without this? <laughs> at one RR, it's also really valuable because it can boost all of your devotion. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, even a curve of this into something basic like the 4-2 that deals damage equal to your devotion, right. that's 7 damage. It's a lot. You know, uh, 4 from the attack and 3 from the vermin, just nothing else. Right, right. So, uh, I, I mean, I really expect this to be a premier card. Mm. Um, it combos very nicely with Perforos God of the Forge. Yep. Combos very well with Monstrous. I mean, every time I see this card, it's doing something even more impressive. <laughs> it, it certainly impressed me. <laughs> Once I untapped with it, man, stuff got real, real, real fast, fast, which does lead us to Perforos, the man whose hammer that belongs yeah, to. Yeah, exactly. So, like, you look at the two cards next to each other, clearly combo very well together. Right. You know, you use the ability of one, they take two, you attack for three. If this is on, you can attack for five with it immediately. Make all your lands bigger. I mean, six they, they combo that. well. Six, sorry, yeah, yeah. it's a six five. Because it's huge. Because it's the biggest <laughs> power one. Yeah, I mean, this is a for real card. This is a very for real card. Oh. Even if it didn't become a creature, that ETB deal two ability, incredible with tokens. Yep. There's a lot of red token making that's legal in the format between Young Pyromancer. Young Pyromancer. 
There's the one mana, one one heroic that makes tokens. Right. I, I think a lot has been said about this card already. Right. It's one of the best cards in the entire set, one of the highest impact cards in the entire set. Absolutely. We're going to be seeing a lot of Porphyros. Ah, good old Porphyros. Yeah. He's, he's, a, he's a good man. He's a very strong design. I love it. Now, the, the fire breathing ability, was, was there a lot of sort of discussion on what his ability should be? Yeah, there were. Uh, I mean, originally I think it had like, uh, you can just do targeted fire breathing in any one of your creatures. Like one red target yeah, creature you control gains plus one plus Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is just, this allows you to like splash it a little bit easier. This allows it, it you know, it makes having more creatures better, which more reinforces the whole devotion to fire, devotion of five thing. Right. As opposed to like it, with regular fire breathing, it's just a single creature, so it's like whatever. Who cares if you're trying to do the thing it's telling you to do? Right. So I think it's just more on story. It's like a decent marginal ability. Sure. You don't need really a whole lot else besides the ETB ability. Right. Does the ETB ability sort of the end of the battlefield? The, the, the end of the battlefield ability, uh, did that change a lot, sort of in the... Well, all, all of these gods changed like 20 times. Yeah, I can imagine. So, they went so through a million different iterations, obviously. We talked about some of the, they started expensive and then now they're less, and then with devotion they turned into a creature. But I can imagine his special ability of whenever a creature enters the battlefield, you know, did it deal one, did it deal two, sure. did it deal three, sure. and so on and so forth. It doesn't take long for it to get really absurd. I, I'm, I'm sure that, so I, I left before this was in exactly this version right here. Gotcha. Uh, so the, you were dealing with different versions of that did different things. Yeah, and so the, ver on, so the versions that I had were definitely more expensive. They turned on when your devotion gave vibe. They were like, they were like nine sixes and stuff. They were, they were huge. <laughs> they were huge. Right, right. Uh, so so I, I mean, I, I'm sure this is a very developed ability. Right. Yes, it's, yes. Like, it's got a lot of numbers. You can tweak all the numbers. Right. I'm sure this is a result of a lot of FFL. <laughs> yes. When I, whenever, yeah, whenever you see a lot of like numbers, right. A, and you see a lot of triggers, B, you know, you, you begin to really see that development spent a lot yeah. of time knowing exactly what was happening with this card. Exactly. And you can feel it. Now, Boon Seder. Oh, yeah. Woo! Woo Best four, two, for three. There's only been three. <laughs> Convert them and now there's been cards really? that have been two twos that, you know, give plus two plus say, oh. I played so much Spur Grappler and Mercadian Mass Block Constructed, yes. man. So there's cards Ball that riders. give themselves, per, you know, uh, one shot boosts. Yeah. But just three mana, four, two does not happen. No, it doesn't happen a lot. And it's it's sort of counterintuitively green, but a thing that we've been doing more for green is it actually makes perfect sense in the color mm. for it to have more power than toughness. I mean, green creatures are big. Right. Green decks are aggressive. They're aggressive right. at all points along the curve. Mm -hmm. Like one of my favorite cards in M13 because of the synergy with uh, with Exalted and other things is the 4-2 Trample for four. Right. You know, it's like it traditionally hadn't been a green card. There's no reason it's not a green card. Right. So this guy, I think, is cool with that. You know, Wolf or Avenger, we really liked the play of it was always like fringe playable and constructed it's like reasonably uh, good yeah, a little bit it got there a few times yeah exactly uh, so, so this is kind of just more of that play style again we like giving green decks advantage uh, resilience against mass removal mm -hmm. that is not just like oh I drew more cards like oh it's a death trigger so like being able to play creatures in speed right a great way of getting around that and then the bestow ability you know, giant gross, whenever you can make them hit constructed, is just a lot of fun. The card is not constructed for the bestow ability. Right. You, most of the time, you're going to be casting the three man four two. Right. But the upside of having access to that is really good when it's good. Right. And, uh, you know, really good in concert with things like Gore Clan Rampager, stuff like that. So, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a very big fan of the play style of this card. Mm -hmm. I personally am going to probably be playing a lot of decks <laughs> with, with this guy in it. I cannot wait to play with Boonsayer and Constructed. It is absolutely pushed. The fact that it's three mana four two, three yeah. mana four two with flash, three mana four two with flash and bestow. <laughs> it's just like chocolate on yep. peanut butter and frosting on sprinkles. There you go. <laughs> it is just like chocolate on peanut butter <laughs> on frosting on sprinkles. That's exactly what it's like. Thank I, you. So Thank you very much. Now, Bo of Nylea, I keep, I will keep bringing it up. Yeah, I, I can. It's what I get to do. You do get to do that. Yeah. I does do. it feel powerful to have a media platform? No. Oh, it, it, that's brand new guy. Because I can just <laughs> totally just, just put the screws in. Because I love Aaron Forsyth. I love him to death. But like the design of this card just cracks me up because it's supposed to be the four seasons. Right. No one gets it unless they're explained to. There's the bone. So the, the plus side is there's that aha moment. There's right. like the, oh, 
I get it, right? Uh -huh. And even if you think of all the abilities now, they line up with the seasons. That's totally cool. And the other half is there is no designer test in which the applicant would ever get a job if they put this card in it. But, 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 but no, but, but so I, I'm going to contest that. Like, oh, I, here we go. Because I've had this argument with a bunch of people where someone okay. just always, I, I mean, I, it is ridiculous. <laughs> if this would ever see it's like it's let's, well, let's hold on a little bit down all right it's a little random though it, that's your problem it's very random right however there there's a precedent <laughs> for this there you know you have obelisk of alara you have like jit you have charge counter things and do oh, stuff jitte is not exactly you have charms. You, wanna... you have charms that come. You know, the you last charms. set had charms. Sure. I'm not saying that like that's a great. Pre I'm saying it's not like you can't just walk in with your hand on your chin and just be like, <laughs> it, it, it is. It is an injustice. <laughs> that someone would. It's like, oh, guys, let's like hang out for a little no, bit. No, so, no, not injustice. It's just funny and weird. It's like it five different weird. things. And it's a legendary enchantment artifact. Kibler wrote a whole big treatise oh, on how he didn't like it. On it. And I love Brian. <laughs> and Brian has opinions. Oh, yeah, we I love Brian. I have opinions. Absolutely. Uh, okay, so if you look at the cycle, like no card exists in a vacuum, right? right? Everything exists in the context of what's going on around it. Of course. So you see these, you know they're weird. Their legendary enchantment artifacts are telling you they're weird. They look weird. Right. And they all have a static ability and activated ability. Right. All of that is consistent with everything we've seen so far. Sure. Right? Now, you have a bow and you have a quiver of four arrows. Mm -hmm. You see that on the card. You look at it, you see that on the card. You see that before you read any of the words on the card. Mm -hmm. All right? You know it's magical. There's some stardust going on around it. <laughs> look, it's so, it's, it's not a just bow a floating bow. in the it's air. It's floating in the air. Floating in the air. So, okay, so attacking creatures have death touch. Yeah. That's like every game ever that is the archery mechanic, right? Sure. It's ranged attack. Right, right. Right? So it's like you're shooting it, you're killing it. Mm -hmm. Then you see four arrows, and you use the ability. It does one of four different things. Mm -hmm. I was playing some, uh, what, what's the game? Uh, Injustice, Gods Among Us. Okay. My favorite character in that is Green Arrow. Okay. The game just came out. I've not played it, so i got no idea. Oh, yeah? He has it's four, a fighting game, right? It's with, fighting with game superheroes. with superheroes. It's by the Mortal Kombat guys. He's using Mortal combat engine okay lo and behold he has four different types of arrows he can shoot hmm. which do four different things <laughs> <laughs> I, i'm not saying this is an illusion uh, to green arrow right I'm right i'm saying the idea of like magic arrows that do stuff right that are is different. not like they are insane and dumb and out of their minds and there is no precedent for this right so you know one arrow does one thing one does it's a weird card it's right. a weird piece of text if you just sent me this in a file from magic 2014 right i would probably not hire you <laughs> but if i'm like hey guess what i've got these five weapons there's these five gods they're holding them in the picture right each one needs to have an activated ability a static ability mm -hmm. make up some abilities I think this card makes sense, and I think it's really cool. <laughs> and when you play with it, it's cool to think about what all the abilities are doing. And for God's sakes, play with it. This yeah, card is insane. It's really good. Wow. It's really good. Someone cast this card against me, and I'm like, mm -hmm. all right, I can't block ever. <laughs> and then he untapped, and I can't block ever. ever. Because he's going to bump it with a plus one, plus one counter, or he's going to do two damage to the flyer I'm trying to block with. It's just, it's madness. The card is incredibly powerful. It's really good. Yeah, so so the haters on for the design is one thing. But yeah, for three mana, this card is absolutely the real deal. Super fun. I think it's, I, I, it's just to be part of it is that it, it provides so much controversy. Yeah, it does. And look, yeah, no one's telling you, <laughs> whoever you are, that you can't have your opinion. Right. I'm not saying, I, look, the, the ones <laughs> of these that I made were different cards. Right. So, I'm not, you need blame? Don't be blaming uh, uh, you. I, I'm not saying that I would have done it this way. I, all I'm saying is when your impulse is to talk about how moronic someone who worked very hard and thought about something a lot is, right. there's probably a little bit more underneath the surface there. A little bit more there. going on there. Exactly. Yes. Bo is sweet. All right, so Mist Cutter Hydra was interesting and almost infamous in oh, that. Oh, yeah. Ben Blywise explained why the he thinks the financial value of this is a bulk rare, and it's because he sort of did this little chart where oh. he said, for one green, 
you get a whatever. You get a you get a, an Elvis mystic for a green and a colorless. You get a grizzly bear, and for a such and such, you get an X and Y. So like as you went up the chain, you had power and toughness either equal to or greater than the mana cost yeah. chain. So at four mana for green, you actually get a five five. At five mana, you can get a six six or no. even even an eight eight if you had a wolf ear silver heart that right, was right. that was uh, or not silver heart. A um, uh, Kelonian Hydra or whatever. Uh, or no, no, it was silver or no, it was silver heart because that was the one that you um, you made yeah, a relationship. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. soul bond. <laughs> yeah. As the, as the Japanese say, you make relationships. Make relationships. Yes, yeah. but you so bond them together. So you could technically have a five mana eight eight. Right. But regardless, you know, he sort of went up this big chain where he was like, this card is not like it's not powerful because it's not correct in the mana cost ratio. And I'm like, uh huh. And then like Forsyth even bounced in the comments and was like, so what would Banefire be <laughs> sort of fair at again if you did it like Banefire for? You know, five and a color, red and five to right. deal five, or is it red and seven to deal seven? At which point did it stop being playable? Right. Versus being essentially a split card of all of those different types of costs, and any of those you can choose at any one well, time. And, and that's exactly the way to think about it, right? Yeah. Is that like split cards have been good for as long as there have been split cards? It's true. Brian was winning with Wax Wayne in there, and so was Kai in 2001. I remember, I remember being at Pro Tour Valencia, yeah. and that was an extended Pro Tour, and um, let's see, uh, Heartbeat of Spring was a very big thing, mm -hmm. and no one could find Wax Wanes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and everybody was looking for Wax Wanes. Wax Wanes was That so was a good. real thing, but yeah. I think I, think I played, I think I played a split card at that Pro Tour. The, the get a multicolored card and do something else. Mm -hmm. I don't remember what it was. I right? can't but it was, eh, 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 whatever. Long but time ago. Anyway, anyway but split cards are good. Split cards are sweet. Split cards give you two options. Right. X spells give you N options. Right. Right. So, you know, you look at a split card, like you're not really going to play giant growth for, you know, or plus two plus two for G in your deck. Right. You're not usually playing W to destroy an enchantment, mm -hmm. but both those together, it's a great option. Right. Right. And like literally, I mean, fire, ice, you know, I mean, there's like any number of these things where like you play them like turn, burn, like, oh, yes, one R shot. Far and away and all that. Far and away. But, but like the whole idea is the more options you have, the less efficient each one needs to be because you're going to make up for that efficiency with your ability to slot it into the situation. Right. So there's a great example of that kind of card where like, well, you know, like am I playing five mana, four, four, haste protection from blue can't be countered? Well, first of all, maybe. <laughs> like, First of all, that's that a legitimate card that you should talk about, yes. Uh, but, but yeah, the fact that it has tremendous flexibility, the fact that, again, like if you just, oh, my draw is so bad, I have 10 mana. Well, right. all of a sudden, you know, like, you get to play stuff that's incredible there. Right. And, and like, Haste Pro Blue can't be counter is just a great combination of abilities. So, sure. you know, I, I think all of that together means that this is a card you can take really seriously. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of synergy with plus one, plus one counters in this format. I mean, you have Colonian Hydra, mm -hmm. you have, uh, you know, all the Simic cards that can manipulate counters. True. You have, uh, you know, fight stuff if your guy has countered. It's not that that's an amazing card or anything. The point is there's things to do with one, one counters. Yeah, there's plenty of stuff you can do and plenty of ways you can manipulate it. And ultimately, I felt that it was kind of a little dismissive early on this card because it just, I mean, in the freaking pre-release, the guy was just like, Make it a 2-2 two -two attack. Yeah, yeah, and then that card yeah, killed me yeah. because I was blue and black at the time before I tried out my hammer perforos and all. But I was blue and black and all I had was a blue creature and they just beat me to death yeah, with this it. thing. Well, I mean, look, I played Quagnoth. Alright, <laughs> I just I did Jody Keat a mono green deck for a PTQ mm. that had four main deck Quagnoth. Whoa. Do you have any idea how much I would rather have a miscutter hydra than a Quagnoth? Pretty much every people time. People were playing Quagnoth and Extended when Mono Blue Fairies is a thing. Wow. So, like, like, people will go far out of their way to have not be countered pro blue. True. And Haste is, like, the best ability in Magic. <laughs> Pretty much so amazing. I, I think this is a real Magic card. We're yeah, right it, it is terrific. So, Nemesis Immortals I wanted to talk about because I thought it was really interesting in that it's in the costs. Yeah, yeah, This yeah. is one of those, like... This is one of those sort of lessons in look at the cost up here and then look at the cost down here and then read its ability <laughs> and then figure it's out mind. what's going on with what's happening yep. here. Because a six mana five five is, is fine for limited. It, yeah. It's okay. Yeah. And then it gets cheaper. And then its <laughs> monstrosity gets really cheap. Yeah. So there's the possibility you could literally pay four mana for a 10-10. And that's exciting. <laughs> that's really exciting. That is stuff. real exciting. Right. I mean, I, I you know, this card happened very late in development. Mm -hmm. 
My gut is there's a number of things going on with this. First of all, there's a lot of stuff in the Golgari mechanic in Return to Ravnica that like lets you lose your, or use your graveyard as a resource. Grizzly Salvage and all that. Yeah, exactly. So it's cool to have a card in this block that can interact positively with that. Right. Um, there's also stuff going on in Limited. There's several cards that just kind of incidentally mill things. Yeah. You've got like Return to Centaur. You've got Draw Three Cards, Mill Three Cards. Mm -hmm. So I think this card is is just has got good synergy right. with some of those archetypes. And like green, blue, green, black, usually are kind of hard to make work in limited. Mm -hmm. So I think this is kind of, yeah, it's, it's not like a deck or anything. It's not like spider spawn. <laughs> but it just gives you some incidental synergy right. with some of the, the milling in the set. And right. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, th this to me, like in terms of someone who wanted to be a game developer, there's a lot you can look at in that it's cost and that it's monstrosity cost and that right. it's ability and how all those things sort of mesh together. The ways that you can push those numbers if you're sort of afraid exactly. of this being too good. You can pull those numbers down if you wanted to be a really big force in Constructed, for example. Right. You know, there's it's, this is very close to being a really amazing Constructed card and there's ways that it's not in that it, and it's just those few little tiny tweaks. Exactly. And that's what I find really fascinating. Yeah, it's a cool card. Really cool. So there's Nylea. She's the god of the hunt. She is eh, amazing and limited. Um, oh, yeah. In Constructed, eh, no one's sure. Yeah, it, it's it's a really hard card to evaluate. So yeah, That's all of them. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, giving your creatures trample, not really worth a whole lot of mana, but it's worth noting that we have a lot of power in uh, standard right now. I mean, I don't mean power like abstractly. I mean, right, like yeah, power like, on creatures. Right, yeah. Power to toughness sort of mana cost ratio is very high. There's the, you know, you get a 2-1 and you get a 2-1 and you get a 2-1 and here's our 2 mana 3-3s three and our 3 mana 5-5s five or 4-4s right. or whatever. And things like Loxodon, Smiter, right, through going to decks like this. You know, a Pool of Kronos, I think, is a really powerful card. Absolutely. So, so you know, like, giving those tramples as opposed to, like, letting the, the lower mana curve aggro decks race them by, mm -hmm. you know, chump blocking and counterattacking is super relevant. Three and a green to give a creature plus two plus two, not really a good rate at all. Right. It's again one of those cards, or one of those effects that doesn't matter until it really matters. <laughs> sort of like with Kessig Wolf Run, you were right. just like, oh, that's part of my mana base, and now I just get to win with this Lana War Elf. Right. You know, and like this card's on the table, all of a sudden you're able to attack for three, five, seven points of damage instead of one. Right. It's very effective. It, yeah, it's very similar. There was a friend of mine, actually, who asked me the other day, he said, he said, I was thinking about, you know, taking out Keswick Wolfram from my cube, and I'm like, are you insane? <laughs> like, an Eldrazi spawn will destroy yeah, somebody with a Keswick Wolfram, and that's right. all you need ever. And so, like, this is a card that, like, you just need a 1-1. One -one. You need an Elvish Mystic. You need something that just lives out there, and it will just get pumped, and we'll just hit them for five or whatever, and we'll have Trample just in, in, incidentally, essentially, yeah. the entire time. Exactly. And, and it's worth noting, this is the biggest god you know, six power and six toughness. Right. You know, it occasionally matters. Um, it, you know, it's a really good blocker. You block and kill almost anything. Sure. So, you know, I mean, again, I, I don't, this is a hard card to evaluate. Sure. Um, I don't think it's like, the nuttiest card ever or anything. It's clearly not the best god. Right. But it's, again, I don't think it's like you look at it and you just, like, write the card off totally. There's a lot of green devotion. And if this card is on, I mean, like, like we're, we're not arguing that a four mana 6-6 six, six indestructible gives all the rest of your creatures trample and has an instant boost ability is somehow a bad card. <laughs> no, no, it's not bad at all. But, yeah. you know, it's one of those where, you know, when you have to rank them, unfortunately she falls to the lower half of that ranking. Right. But... They're all pretty naughty. Uh, <laughs> it's just, you know, it's really interesting that uh, sort of the abilities are what they are. The the target creature gets plus two, plus two is four mana versus any other mana Any cost. other mana, three, two, one. Right, you know, or yeah. two green and a colorless or two, two. It's certainly not a good rate. Two colorless. It's not a great rate. They don't really want it to yeah. be, but uh, but it is terrific and limited for sure. Yeah, oh yeah. Here's Sylvan Cariated. This is a card. This to me was like hexproof done right. I love yeah. it. I mean, let's face it, Geist was maybe a little, you know, a Geist little. Geist very aggressive. Aggressive. I should say. <laughs> I, I'm a man that likes a hexproof creature. I, I subscribe I, to the Brian Kibler Maxim that a great way to deal with hexproof is by attacking your opponent. Okay. A very powerful thing to do. It's but, true. Uh, th this is a very different type of hexproof. This right. is hexproof basically says, look, you're, it's going to be a mana creature, it's going to be reliable. You can reliably block with it if you want to. Sure. Um, actually, I think the thing that's cool about this card is that it encourages giant growths and enchantments and constructed. Sure. Because, you know, it's going to brick wall your jackal pup unless you're playing boost effects. Right. And, like, if you're able to hit this with a boost effect, it's really powerful. 
Right, Absolutely. if you're able to like... Gore Clan Rampage, your fire drinker Seder or whatever. Like, yeah, exactly. It's a time walk on top of everything else. Yeah, you're in good shape. Exactly. So I love that this card encourages the things that Theros is trying to make good, mm -hmm. which are ways to boost your own creatures. Sure. That's And it, it also, you know, it's it's like Farseek. It's less powerful than Farseek because, you know, it gets hit I was with gonna say, and stuff Yeah, like I was going to say, is this sort of like why this guy exists is that we didn't you didn't want to reprint Farseek or you didn't want to reprint Rampant Growth or Wild Growth or whatever. You're just yeah. like, well, we're definitely not reprinting Wild Growth. <laughs> I, uh, you can quote well, me on that now. Well, Wild Growth is, well, one thing. <laughs> I'm thinking the uh, fertile, fertile Ground. Fertile Ground, yeah. That's what I'm thinking of. Um, but the but Sylvan Carriated sort of is the fixed version when you don't want there to just be a Farseek in the format. You make it a creature, you make it hard to deal with, and it's still very powerful. Yeah, that, and that's exactly right. I mean, and it's cool that it can block, so it's like less of a bad late game draw than first. It's just a really interesting card. Uh, Eric Lauer was really excited to put this in the set. Hmm. I, you know, it's like clearly wildly better than Utopia Tree. It's cool. <laughs> clearly and wildly, yes, 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 yes. All of those things. It's cool that it synergizes with uh, Axbane Guardian. Mm -hmm. If you're going to do a thing like that, it's <laughs> precious. Sure, uh, sure. So yeah, I, I, I just think this, the, you know, this is the new territory of Farseek, and you're going to have to rely less on sweepers if you're previously a Farseek deck like Jund right. that tried to accelerate into, I mean, you know, it was after sideboard, but things like Barter and Blood, sure. um, Rob, Wrath of the Gods, yeah, or whatever there's a Devour is, Flush now in, uh, in Ravnica. Yeah, yeah. And actually, I've heard some people say that they're going to start looking at Devour Flesh for their black decks or their black red decks because this card exists. Yeah. Period. Yeah, no, I think that's a really reasonable approach. Right, which makes sense. So, super cool. Now, Annex <laughs> and Siamid. Now, apart from being two people on one card and whatever, um, sort of tell me, can you tell me, like, were you around when this was being finalized, when this was a thing? Was there sort of versions of this that you had saw at any one time? Yeah, so we always knew that we wanted different heroes that were kind of... Uh, allusions to different characters in mythology. Sure. I I should, I, I don't actually know who this is a reference to, uh, but... I don't know Greek mythology. I, and I, I actually I, hit I, that a couple times when the Titan of, the Titan of something fire, the one that lets the oh, humans... Oh, yeah, Prometheus. The, the Prometheus card. Fire. Yeah, yeah, Titan of Eternal Fire. There you go. The, I just didn't know. I yeah. just, it's been a long time since I look at Greek mythology. When I do, <laughs> when I do learn about it, I love it. I find it super fascinating. I like, I find the world fascinating, but you know, it's anything I can learn more about is great. And uh, and then these types of guys, I'm sure they reference some really cool, iconic Greek mythology, something or other. But ultimately, for me, in terms of the development design aspect, which is, it's Boros colors, it's three two first strike vigilance for three, which is already really yeah. good. Yeah. But the heroic is super super good. Yeah, the heroic's incredible. I th I mean, I definitely, if you look at the red white cards. They are all trying to encourage like a, a very wide rather than tall deck. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of tokens, a lot of creatures. You've got the red white card for or the the one two for red and white. The when right. you attack, it gets plus X plus zero for your attackers. Right. That obviously is incredible with this. Indeed. Then you've got the the card that we spotlighted earlier. Right. Uh, one two heroic. The hoplite. Yeah. Hoplite. You've yeah. got the one one that makes one ones. So you just got this like red white heroic deck like, made for you. Yes. And uh, I, I think that this is just kind of a perfect capstone to that. And again, you want like a level one deck to make sense. Sure. You want it to be intuitive. You want to. You want you want people to be able to say, that. you know, g you know, look for heroic, you know, exactly. in the text. Yeah. Bring up the white and red cards and be like, oh, if uh -huh. I put this and that and this for my one twos and threes. Right. Like, yeah, that that works all together. You know, sometimes you need to give them the building blocks. Exactly. To and, make sure and, they get it. And and you want it to be cool, right? So like right. legends are cool. Yep. This card is legendary. Indeed. You're just like, oh, I'm supposed to put this cool card in my deck. Mm -hmm. And then you do, and your deck works really well. Right. The ability is obviously bananas. Puzzle, puzzle, what I true, uh, though. Uh, I mean, it itself goes to 4 3. All of your guys get huge. Oh, all of them gain trample BT dubs. Yeah, like. it, this, this is a nice one. This, <laughs> this is a hard and fast, nice, sweet one. Right yeah, you, it's really, really good and limited. It's possibly terrific and constructed, yeah. I, I hope. At the very worst, it allows someone to just, again, put the yep. pieces together, build a heroic deck, have fun with it, and it all works. Exactly. Super neat card. Now, Ashiok, here we are back in the Planeswalkers. <laughs> tell, tell me how you feel about old Ashiok. Yeah, so this, like, you've got to be super cautious about three mana Planeswalker. Indeed. Right? Uh, this is the first Demir Planeswalker. Mm -hmm. I think this is a cool card. It's like using your own, your opponent's own resources against them. Right. There's kind of a mystery element to it. It's like the bigger it is, the more it does. 
Someone told me that two of this card's uh, abilities don't do anything. Let me tell you that this ultimate is really good. <laughs> it's like, it, I did super identity crisis. Yeah, like like you, I mean, you slip it, clearly this is a control mirror card at exactly. least partially. You slip it on turn three. It's five, seven, nine, eleven, and then you've just got a mind twist sitting. Right now, before the white two one and the black two one and the red two one, this came out first, and I was like, oh man, oh. this is like maybe main deck game. constructed playable stuff. And I was like, oh, there comes the aggro, well, but, and now but, he kind of kind of got to draw it back a little bit. A little. It's going to be for me. It's actually really good against weenie aggro decks. Right. If you right? can get one yourself and keep her around. Yeah, exactly. You're in I mean, good like shape. You just plus five it. Right. If they're like, what are they? If they can deal five damage to your creature on turn three, and you have no defense. Okay, good for them. Right. You still gain five life, which is not good for three mana. It's not the worst thing ever. Exactly. But if you're able to untap with a card at all, either you can make them keep pressuring it, right. or you can just you know minus one it to get a grizzly bear of your own and start protecting it. I mean, it's really. Quite good. Yeah, and that's that was sort of what I was sort of talking out in that you know when, as soon as it caught, as soon as it first got spoiled, they're like, eh, it's just going to be in the family of drown yard, and I'm like, well, no. no, I mean like you know if you're against the little mono aggro or the mono red aggro or whatever, like if you can get any part any defensive thing at all, I mean you know the a lot of the thing is like can the planeswalker defend itself? Right. No. If it can't, what's it doing? Really powerful things that are going from three to five, and a Johnny Call of the Pride was very similar, in that it wasn't just cut and dry. It can't defend itself, so it's terrible. Right. It, it, it had, yeah, like, uh, like a Johnny, which you see in constructed play, mm -hmm. Ashiok has five toughness right out of the gates. Right. So, like, five is not very easy to get on the third turn. Right. And, like, even if you, like, you mill them, you're hitting three cards, and a lot of constructed aggro decks have, you know, between 24. 26 creatures. Right. Some have 30, some have more than that. Right. Like, you're, you're very likely to hit a creature. Right. It's also very likely to be five or fewer loyalty, or mm -hmm. five or fewer converted mana costs. Right. You don't just jam your deck full of titans. So if you pay three mana, and then sack your planeswalker to get a five cost guy, mm -hmm. you just paid three mana for a five cost creature. Yeah, I was <laughs> like, like, very good. I was like, just, I just, just imagine our older format, right? Let's imagine you played Ashiok and you plus two and you revealed Huntmaster of the Fails. Yeah, right. Like, they have to hit Ashiok <laughs> or they are so <laughs> dead. It is ridiculous. Yeah. Like, they have to. They have to deal at least one, at least, you know, hopefully two damage so they don't get a free Huntmaster of the Fails or whatever it is. And that, you know, that same thing can sort of be, can be put across a multiple uh, types of decks, but the, the idea that Ashiok is not just do nothing. Like no. it is it is putting pressure. It is answering things. It is a terrific control mirror planeswalker. But I think it could be maybe a little bit better than that. Yeah, I think this card is a very good card. Mm -hmm. If the consensus in the real world is this card doesn't do anything, I'd recommend going and purchasing copies of this card. <laughs> The, the Try it for yourself. Now, Daxos Amelitus, in my complete set review, I, I, I took off uh, what new R&D member, uh, Adam Prozac. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. He, he, he saw this card, he read it, and he said, well, it, it has an invisible keyword. The keyword is dies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this card dies. Card now, die. If it had hex proof, it would be insane. It would die less. It yeah. would die a lot less. It would be, in fact, ridiculous. But but I, as it stands, it's one that is very very powerful, very looks great. But I think you know it, it, it does die a lot. It definitely dies a lot. Yeah. Um, it doesn't die in control mirrors as much, mm -hmm. where this card's unbelievable. Indeed. Uh, it's very similar to Augury Adept. It has some evasion, which is actually extremely good. In exchange, you don't draw the card; you have to cast it then. Right. Um, I, you know, Night Vale Spectre I think is a very fun card. I love that this card kind of gets around the Night Vale Spectre. Uh, mana restriction. Sure. I think that rules. Right. Also, just like hitting them and gaining a bunch of life is like very good, right? So I mean, it, yeah, it dies. It's pretty sweet. It dies, but like if if what you're saying is okay, well, I'm gonna pay m play my three mana two two, and you have to kill it. It's really good three mana two two. Right. Yeah. That, that's you know? something they have to pay attention to. They have to use removal spell on it immediately. They can't wait till later. It is still good. There's actually a couple cards in this set that say, until end of turn, you may cast that card and you may spend yeah. any mana as though or any color to cast it, so on and so forth. Yeah. That's really interesting to me that that's seen on multiple cards Yeah, now. it is. I mean, I think really with, like, Night Vale Spectre is our favorite card in Gate Crash. Mm. Um, I think we just really like that play pattern of, mm -hmm. like, you know, you're using your opponent's stuff against them, but you're not, like, briberying them. Right. You know, it's kind of a tactical thing. you got to be lucky enough to have you something you're going to be able to play. So it's, like, fun variants. It's, like, card advantage, but not as raw as, like, 
plus one card. Right. And like the the more uh, like the really feel bad thing is like when you you you're like you disincent your opponent for doing awesome things mm -hmm. by taking their awesome things and beating them with it. Mm -hmm. That sucks. But the great thing about this effect is the more awesome of a thing you hit, right. the harder it's going to be for you to capitalize on it. Right. Like it's hard for me to just jam my opponent's Aurelia the War Leader, mm -hmm. you know, unless I just have six open mana. Exactly. So, you know, so I, I think it, it dodges that issue pretty well. This card is like, it, it's pretty clear what it does. Like, mm -hmm. yes, you have to kill it. Presumably, you're going to be playing the deck where they have to kill a lot of your cards. Mm -hmm. um, and it also, you can't ignore the fact that it wins a race by itself. I mean, unless you're just bricking on lands all the time. So, you know, it kind of has pseudo lifelink. I think this is a very real card. I like it a lot. I like that it has protection from Boros Reckoner, has yeah. protection from all the fatties. Yep. Like, you know, that's that's a good thing. I agree it will die a lot, but it should be in a deck where a lot of other things will be dying yeah, a lot, too. Yeah, like, oh, I'm really disappointed that my opponent has to kill my card or they lose. <laughs> they have to have <laughs> removal? Sad. In magic? Oh. <laughs> Fleece main line. Oh, yeah. Best Watch Wolf of all time. <laughs> yeah. What, what? Tell yeah. me about this guy. This yeah. guy's insane. So this card was also basically in the file for, from the beginning. Wow. It was originally a Nemean Lion, which was a trope that we wanted to play into. The lion whose hide was indestructible. Mm -hmm. uh, it always was big and got bigger and got hexproof and indestructible. Mm -hmm. um, it started out, I think, as a four mana, four five or something, and then the monstrous was six. We just decided to keep pushing it down, give the green white. So those were like the, the green white ember swallower type type yeah. stats, and yeah, then exactly. kind of pushed just, it down. We, we wanted a card that had like a pretty wide gap between when you cast it and when you monstrous it. Mm -hmm. We liked the idea that the counters weren't the like show, mm -hmm. you know, but that like, you know, it, it's like, oh, five mana to monstrosity one, but like hexproof and destructible, you're like, oh, I can get excited about that. Oh, yeah. And really, it's just like you, you, the opportunity cost of paying a three mana, th or a two mana, <coughs> three, three is so low mm -hmm. that the fact that it has any ability at all is incredible. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Like Watch Wolf. Awesome. Right. Watch Wolf that gets ridiculous. Like, Amazing. Yeah, totally. And, and we like that it was a trope that was, you know, one of the Hercu Hercules labors was that uh, it, it, you know, they had to, he had to kill the lion. Mm -hmm. And so the, his trick was, I'm going to wrestle it to death and strangle it because mm -hmm. you can't pierce it. There's a, I think a slight allusion to this where you see all these swords and shields in its lair because they just <laughs> don't do anything. Right. So. That's nice. kind of what's going on with this card. That's unreal. This card is totally sweet. There's Metamai, <laughs> yeah. the Ageless. That's a Ooh, hell of yeah. a Sphinx. So a, a thing that a lot of people don't realize is that uh, sp Sphinges are actually from Greek mythology. Even sphinges? Though sphinges? Sphinges. Sphinges? You can also say Sphinxes, but Sphinges is... Is that technically off, correct? There, there are two technically correct ones. I get to sound like more of a pompous ass <laughs> by saying Sphinges. <laughs> That's upside. You have earned your plus one Bombas ass award today. <laughs> Joy. <laughs> so I'm going to say that. But yeah, sphinxes are originally Greek. Hmm. Um, you, you know, the Egyptian mythology, Egyptian and Greek mythology and Egyptian and Greek culture actually have a lot of overlap. Hmm. Uh, the Ptolemaic dynasty ruled Egypt for a while, actually a bunch of Greeks. So there was a bunch of uh, overlap nice. there. So we knew we wanted to have cool sphinxes. And uh, one of the things sphinxes can do is predict the future. So a cool thing that happened was... Uh, Okay, what if he doesn't just predict the future? What if he just makes the future happen? Absolutely. And that was kind of the story of this guy, but we're like, how do we not loop it? Originally, we had the time walk ability as like a monstrous ability, so it was like you did it once. That was cool, but we didn't want a blue-white card that was monstrous. It's kind of mm. lame. It's kind of so weird. we came up with just like, okay, well, get you some extra turns, but you can't attack during them. Right. And uh, I think this card is a really awesome, really exciting I have no idea how good it is, but it's a really fun card. Yeah, it's one of those where it feels like it's either going to run the format <laughs> or do not a lot in the right. format. You know, it kind of it, it is of two minds, and but it is certainly, I think it's certainly mythic. You know, it oh, feels yeah. mythic, feels definitely super different. big, super impressive. I I love it a lot. Um, Paulus Crusher. <laughs> this to me is a very much a development card. It is a development card. I mean, th there there's. It makes more sense in the story if you sort of think about what's going on. So mm. you've got like the monsters versus the polis. And it's called the polis crusher in case there was any ambiguity at all that this guy was from the land of the monsters trying to attack the cities. Okay. Right? Um, the cities are where all the heroes are. You look at all the heroes, they're essentially all human. Right. Um, all the things they do are, you know, they've got the heroic ability. It's like clearly the I want to be enchanted ability. Mm -hmm. If you look at red and green, none of the monsters care about enchantment. Right. They're they're none of they're very rarely heroic. It's usually sentient beings that are heroic. Right. The monsters usually just get bigger by themselves. Mm -hmm. The monsters are base red green. Uh, the heroes are base 
blue, red, white, um, and black kind of is its own thing. It's all about death in the underworld. Yeah. yeah. So the the Polis Crusher is basically the monsters. Like I hate the cities. We're the forces of chaos. We're gonna attack you. Because Greek mythology is about heroes overcoming monsters. Right. The idea is heroes get bigger by enchanting them up and suiting them up. Mm -hmm. Monsters get bigger by just using their ability and being big. Right. So the protection of enchantments comes from monsters hating enchantments. Right. That said, it's also probably an environmentally developed thing. Uh, but I mean, this is an <laughs> but thematically, it still works. Thematically, right? I mean, this is an enchantment set. Right. So I mean, you're going to have a card that is like hating on enchantments. Right. I mean, like a null right. is in the set. You a know what I mean? Like, right. And then that's very much sort of I feel like a, a development choice, and that you want the antithesis of what you're doing to be in the set that you're you're currently featuring it in. Otherwise, you'd have what I describe as the affinity problem. Right. That, no, that's <laughs> exactly right. And I mean, it's like okay, whatever. It's not the end of the world that someone can get a free demystify on you on turn six. Right. Right, but you know, it's a 4-4 four, four, trample four, not poorly costed at all. Pro enchantments, it's good against gods, it's good against pacifism. The main thing I think that we're gonna see with this guy is then get hit by chain to a rock. Yeah. Which is very important. Right, can't um, chain it to the rocks. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, I think this is just kind of a, a good card in the context of the block, kind of does what it says it does. Right. And uh, occasionally has pretty huge upside. Absolutely, so here's profit. There's a prophet. There was a seedborn muse <laughs> oh, yes. who only oh, did yes. one half of this card, but now we get both halves. Now we get almost a Teferi, not quite. We don't really want Teferi yeah, back because right. Teferi was ridiculous. But I bring Teferi back. <laughs> but tell me about Prophet of Krufix. So uh, this is a card that I know people like. Mm -hmm. I like Commander is not fun to me. I don't play Commander I just either. don't like it, but I know Commander players love this. Not that there's anything wrong with Commander's that. Commander's amazing. I love Commander. I, I love I've it made exists. I've many Commander cards. I have worked on Commander sets. Yes. So I'm, I'm definitely not hating on Commander. Right. It's not my cup of tea. It's just not my thing. This is clearly a Commander card. Right. Um, But, I mean, it's worth noting, even in one-on-one -on -one magic, it's mm -hmm. essentially a zero mana card. Mm -hmm. Right? Because, like, you're probably playing a lot of creatures. Right. This immediately untaps everything that you have once you cast it. So you can kind of go off with this card. Right. You, know, you cast your card drawing spells on your turn, untap, cast all your creatures on their turn. Right. So, I, I mean, it, it's kind of, you know, it, it's context independent of the set, sort of. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, that's part of the thing is, like, when I see newer designers' sets, you know, I was like, look at my set or whatever. And they, you know, people all, just for fun, make their own magic set. New people, wizards, everything is, like, so tight and cohesive. Mm -hmm. You want like 90% of your environment to be tight and cohesive. But you want but some then, of it to just be... Right. There's going to be people who don't care about the whole Greek thing. They don't care about enchantments. They don't care about monsters or like whatever. Right. I just, I want to play magic my way. That's what I want to do. You've got to make cards for them. Right. There's some There's some points I can imagine where you get sort of almost too navel gazy. Oh, that's you know? exactly right. Where you're just like, everything has to be like enchantment, god, monster. Yeah. It has to have the <laughs> keyword on everything. It has to talk about it every single time. I say something about targeting things or right. doing things with right. power over X, Y, and Z. But... Not always. Not always. And that's the thing we ran into in the original Ravnica block, mm -hmm. was that sometimes there weren't just enough, like, this card is cool. Like, I, I call them lightning helixes, mm -hmm. right? Because, like, lightning helix is not Boros. Right. It's just like, what does red do? Gain, deal damage. What does right. white do? Gain life. Well, cool card. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and it could go right. anywhere, but it right. makes sense that it goes where it is. So, right. profit, just it, it makes sense mm -hmm. that, okay, we've got some gold cards. There are not as many as in Ravnica, but mm -hmm. there's still some stuff. We don't want you to have gotten really excited about your Celestia deck and then be like, well, I wish they'd print me a card for the next year. <laughs> you know, so or we, we give people deck. some goodies. Yeah, yeah. For, for your Simic deck. Absolutely. So it's, it's a neat card that fills a different role. Now, Steam Augur, you mentioned yeah. you weren't really around for that one. I was not around for this one, but, but I know what's going on because we've always talked about this kind of card. Ooh, tell me. Uh, first of all, I, th there's some artist that this looks like their art and then it is Dave Kendall and so that blew my mind. It's like, <laughs> I, I forget what it is. It, like, lo this looks like a piece of very old school magic art that gets sure. me very excited. Absolutely. Steam Augur, yeah, it's just reverse factor. It's actually picture. Richard Kane Ferguson is what this reminds me it of. It looks a lot like RKF, yep. yeah. But it, it, the guy did like Death Ward or something. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm going to look this up on Gather after we've done this interview. <laughs> it is sort of like RKF. There's another sure. person I was thinking of did a bunch of stuff in like Mirage. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was Dave Guy. I don't know. But Dave, anyway, this is a boring conversation I'm going to stop having. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Steam Augury, it's amazing to me 
how just a slight difference from factor fiction mm -hmm. makes a card very different from factor fiction. So like right. factor fiction is amazing at digging mm -hmm. and amazing at bluffing that you need to be digging. Right. This card highly rewards just consistency mm -hmm. because if every card in your deck's the same, it's just like three mana instant speed draw three cards. Right. Right. So I, I think it's interesting how it, 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 it sort of brings the reverse into play with just like a very moderate difference in wording. Mm -hmm. um, another thing about factor fiction is, you know, it, it was always a really fun thing to do. Like the mini game was fun, the card was just way too powerful. So by making it gold, right. and by offering a competing card advantage incentive to Sphinx's Revelation, mm -hmm. I think you diversify the blue decks in the format a little bit. Right. And then like you just get to play this interesting mini game that I think is on the whole a little bit less raw power than factor fiction. It really is, and it was designed to be that way. And it's really nice to have something that isn't just like, uh, like why are you not playing Sphinx's Revelation? You know what right. I mean? Like right. you're playing blue, but you're not playing well, the like best card draw huh. spell. Why not? Well, here's a really really good card draw spell. Here's a, here's a card that you can really just have people play poorly. Right. You know, so there is oh, the yeah. mini game, and there is the ability like you know, oh I need a wrath so bad. <laughs> Turn over Supreme Verdict and four of the cards. You you just snap, go Supreme Verdict, yeah, four of the yeah, cards. Yeah, yeah, right. And they give you the four cards. And you're like, thank you, thank you, bro. Supreme Verdict. Yeah, you know, uh -huh. the last card in my hand, so on and so forth. So that's that's the sort of mini games this comes up with. I think it's brilliant. I think it's good at rare too. Yeah. Like there were some people yeah. saying, well, you know, Factor Fiction was uncommon. I'm like, Factor Fiction was no, freaking please, ridiculous. Please, please. No, <laughs> Factor Fiction was like, you have to like run a subroutine to like play Factor Fiction. No, that card's not an uncommon. Yeah, it is. It is ridiculous, and and this card is is similarly. <laughs> Powerful. Like the, separate them into two piles. <laughs> are we, are, what game are we playing? <laughs> exactly. No, I are. think this card is like clearly a rare. Yeah, super cool card. Try out of the fates is interesting. Did, was this around when you were working on the yeah, set? Yeah, it was. So we tried like numerous different versions of the fates. Right. And everyone it was like cool. We knew we wanted to mark people with fate. We liked the card bounty hunter, mm -hmm. but there like there were different ones doing different things. They were like predicting the future. We liked them that like. So this card, it can either like condemn you to fate, or it can help you avoid fate, which sure. is like the flicker thing versus kill you. Right. We didn't want it to be like a Vasara, so we didn't want it to just like kill you all the time. Right. And like so the whole like, like the most important force in uh, Greek mythology was destiny and fate. You, mm -hmm. you like you couldn't get out of it. There were a lot of stories about like people working so hard to get out of their destiny, and no matter just what gets they did, them, right? No matter, no matter what, what you do. Yeah, and, and, and so the idea of like the power of it and that like a central theme in a lot of Greek mythology was like coming to terms with your fate and accepting it, mm. or the tragedy being that you never did that. Right. So it, like being able to draw two cards is kind of like, okay, sometimes like y your fate hits you for the greater good. Right. You know, um, and, and in addition <laughs> to a cool game balance thing. So, so this card is super resonant to me. I like that there's three fates. I like that it's white and black. Right. It, you know, it's three like fates, very three different things. Like one marks you, one does this thing, yep. one does the other thing. Three different abilities. It's just beautiful. And I think you can actually see that distinction in the art mm -hmm. somewhat. Although I, I did. Obviously, I, I the one with the tell. big blade is killing yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> but sacrificing you. Yeah. Right, right. Sacrificing you for sure. So that, that, that to me is, is I, a I love that card. So here's the Cerberus. Yeah, so we knew we wanted to make, like, Magic has had, like, Cerberus-ish things. They've had Hellons. They haven't had, like, the proper Cerberus. Right. So uh, this card was around for a while. We're like, okay, what does Cerberus do? Mm -hmm. Well, it guards the Underworld, and it has three heads. It's like, let's make a card for that. Okay. So you can't be blocked up by three more creatures. Makes sense. Uh, cards in graveyards can't get out. Or it can't be the target of the spell or Because it's protecting them. Yeah, it's protecting them. Mm -hmm. Just like, don't mess with me. This is my Underworld. And then when it goes away, everyone in the Underworld's like, yeah! Woo, party time! And then get out of there. You don't want to just <laughs> hang out in the Underworld. The Underworld sucks. Right. So that's that's how we made the card. And then we knew we wanted it to be, you know, aggressively costed, something you could think about playing. Right. 6-6 six, six that essentially can't be blocked for five. Pretty good. Pretty powerful stuff. And uh, really good against, like, a Supreme Verdict type of effect. But it was just a, it was a powerful magic card. Right. And it was designed to be, and I love sort of how flavorful it is, and I enjoy the... The, the, the thinking of like, well, sometimes if they kill my Underworld Cerberus, it's actually bad for me. Right. Because it gets back more Their creatures guys. for them than, yeah, than sure. my guys, but that's sort of the push and pull of the yeah, card. Yeah, it is. There's Enigos, <laughs> the Reveler, <laughs> the man himself. How you feel about him? 
I love this card. Yeah. I will say he is very, very integral to the plot. Mm -hmm. He is kind of the god of mischief and revelry. Right. I think as a planeswalker, he's really interesting. He's very, in my opinion, comparable to the first Garrick. Uh, is it the first? <sighs> so good, because that's exactly the good comparison I did in the show. Oh, really? In the Maddie show. Oh, cool. I said he reminds me very much of Garrick Wildspeaker. Makes mana, makes dudes, has a cool ultimate. Yeah. Not quite the same, but both still very powerful. Yeah, Go ahead. exactly. And you've got, uh, you know, the first ability, it, it can add tons of mana, which is the exciting part. But right. in general, it's going to add a, you know, reasonable amount like of mana. Like two, like Garrick did. Maybe yeah. more, which is the exciting part, sure. Right. And then maybe less when you don't have creatures. Right, right. I love the idea of Planeswalkers giving haste tokens because, you know, you can still play it defensively. Right. But the damage from this really adds up. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, two haste and then four next to six damage from this one card. Right. While giving you creatures for the first ability. Right. I think that rules. I love the fact you can top deck it. You yeah. know what I mean? Like in the top deck war, you're like, yeah. oh, sweet, Xenagos, get you. You know, like that's awesome. Yeah. That, I love that, that. That part is really sweet. Right. And uh, I, I just, I, I, I like that it's a planeswalker and threaten other planeswalkers. Mm -hmm. I just think it's a, a really cool, interesting, engaging card. It's an interesting decision to me, and I, I remember being part of this conversation. We're like, do we want two red, green, gold planeswalkers at the same time? Yeah, Especially you want the like, Dombri and the Xenagos decks? Yeah, right, and, and right, because they both like reward you for having a lot of creatures. Mm -hmm. Dombri is just really good. Right. Um, and, and you know, you don't want to make one just intentionally bad, so you kind of make them do slightly different things. Right. At the same time, like, red, green is going to care about creatures. Not gonna not care about creatures. Exactly. And you don't want them to be at odds with each other because that's just a feel bad. You're right. like, oh, I've got these players that's weird. Play them together. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, it's 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 a tension on the format to have two different gold planeswalkers for sure. Mm -hmm. But I I mean, this card's fun and is cool. So I like it. The card is sweet. Now Nykthos, which is our second to last cards that we're going to talk about. Nykthos is your baby, I believe, as you yeah, described it. Is. So I was uh, in design, the person that was really pushing for Chroma to come back into the set. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea was you'd have battlefields be flooded with permanents. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I wanted there to be something to do with those permanents. I thought it was boring if you had to, like, count permanence. Right. And I like the idea of this world by these gods. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the color was something that I really thought should matter. And I thought that, like, Basically, before we realized that devotion was one to one that, I thought it made sense that like you should be rewarded for being more aligned with a color. Sure. In the way that like you know, in, in classical Greek mythology, you had like temples to Artemis or temples to you know any number of these gods. Sure. It was kind of like your faction. Right. So I really believed in devotion. I thought it had tons of synergy with enchantments. Uh, but they were like, you know, look, like Chroma is stupid and everyone hated it. And it <laughs> yeah, was Chroma lame. was bad. It was just bad. And so we're like, okay, I, I think we can make this work. We basically were like, okay, well, the reason we care about it is because of all the battlefield stuff. Mm -hmm. So let's make it only matter for stuff on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. That simplified it a lot. And mm -hmm. then it's like, okay, what cool stuff can we do with this? Before we even got to the guard, the, the gods, this was one of my cards. Because I was like, okay, everyone loves Cabal Coffers. Mm -hmm. Let's do it for permanence instead of lands. Mm -hmm. You have to work harder for it. Right. But the upside is potentially higher. And most importantly, you can actually just allow this land to tap for a mana. <laughs> so that, you know, you're not just like, well, I drew this on the second turn. I want to die. Right. Well, that's sort of like one of the design... Uh, I don't know if it's a New World Order thing, but I, I'm pretty sure that at some point it was like all lands have to tap for colorless mana. Right. They can't just do something else. Yeah, exactly. Right. Because that's just so counterintuitive, right? You want to look at your lands, you want to look at the number of cards and be like, this is how much mana I have. Right. So, and the thing about Nykthos is that, like, you don't even have to go crazy with it. Right. Like, if you just have a Boros Reckoner, then, and like anything else, this adds two mana. Lands that add two mana, your mana were really good. Really amazing. And like, you know, Brad Nelson's playing back around like Chandra and uh, Chandra's Phoenix. And Ember, uh, Ember Swallower was Ember in there Swallower as well. Ember Swallower was in there, yep. yep. Right, so you know, like, like the, and that mana, this can generate like six, seven, eight mana. Right. Um, also good in decks like Rakdos Return, stuff to do with it, but also just trigger monstrosity. So I think this is an exciting card. I like that it's a you know a colorless land that kind of takes things a different direction from mutable. Right. I like that it's it and the gods both make devotion exciting. Mm -hmm. I like that it's a shrine, so like y it literally feels like devotion. You know, you feel like yeah. you're praying to your color. Right. Uh, this is one of my favorite cards in the set. It's, I really like it. All. Yeah, it just totally works. Super flavorful, amazing all star. So yeah. lastly, I've got the Temple of Abandon. We have the Temple <laughs> of Seed. We have the Temple of Mystery and of Silence and of Triumph. Yeah. 
here we are. Tell me about the Scrylands. Yeah, so the Scrylands were in there. Um, the, uh, we, we knew we wanted a cycle of dual lands in this set. Mm -hmm. We knew we were going to rotate out the Magic 2010 lands mm -hmm. um, along with the Innistrad lands because, you know, A, those were kind of, uh, we knew what their power level would be with Return to Ravnica, but we knew that was high, so we kind of wanted to shift things up a little bit. Right. Well, you sort of wanted to, and it's a lot of the, the cyclical, cyclical of like the uh, Xanthra Necromancer is very similar. Right. Like you give them all the toys. Exactly. And then you and then take, you take away. Away. Right. So uh, we, we eventually decided upon the Scrylands um, pretty late going. There were there was just mm. a lot of different modules. I forget exactly what were in there. Uh, like different dual land type stuff? Yeah. Dual there, land there types. There may have been like the, the Graven Cairn cycle. Mm. I, I don't the future no, site. No, no, I, I, no, those weren't in there. Oh. That, there were, I don't know. There, there were several different things. There, there's a whole yeah. There's a million different ways you could have done them, but you ultimately but, but ended up we, we ended up going with these. We knew right. we wanted uh, a come to play tap cycle just to slow things down a little mm -hmm. bit after like you know really kind of being spoiled for all your lands coming to play untapped whatever. Um, and then with the thing that we realized, we like okay, we went through our mechanics. We like wanted them all to have places it constructed, mm -hmm. uh, and we realized like Scry was on a couple powerful cards, mm -hmm. um, but like you know Magma Jet like we'd seen before. So we and knew so, how good it was. Yeah, and so we're like, how is Scry really is at its best when it's just kind of smoothing stuff over a little bit better? Right. Um, and so we decided a great place to do that would be on a land. It helps you be mana flooded less, helps you be mana screwed less. It's really subtle. Mm -hmm. You don't have to make a million decisions. Right. Um, and it's it's pretty interesting. I was very scared of these because I'm very concerned when like what I call ponders are the best card of the format, mm -hmm. where like you have all these invisible decisions that you have to make really early, mm -hmm. but that you like. Your opponent isn't knowing when you're out playing them by making, you know, knowing what card to put third from the bottom versus second. Right. But you're beating them because of that. And yet, like, it's really hard to improve when that's the way you're getting defeated. Right. Like, if your card valuation Almost is bad, you get two for one. Right. But, like, right. you don't see it. And so it's hard to have learning moments. Right. But if I cast an enchantment and you Doomblade that guy, I get I that get I should not do that. Exactly. <laughs> right. Or, like, oh, okay, I need to have more creature removal. Or, like, oh, you played a five cast, a uh, five power guy, so Celestia enchantment. Like, you know, or you, you get those things better. Or, like, oh, sure. my, you just thought about combat more than me. These are, like, very incremental decisions mm -hmm. that add up over the course of the game. Mm -hmm. The other thing that sort of annoys me about these is that it comes to play tapped, so you want to play it as early as possible, mm -hmm. but ideally you actually want to be scrying unless something's wrong as late as possible, right. so you can have the most information to know what to do with the card. Right. That said, you know, they're all, like, people are playing gates anyway. That's these right. are tremendous upsides to gates. Right. So the end was kind of decided, like, well, whatever. Like, if you need to play it early, you're just going to play it early. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the effect is minimal enough that players are actually appreciate being able to be, you know, mana flooded less, mana screwed less. Right. And that's just kind of a good feeling. Right. So it's a dangerous space, but I think it's, I, I think these are, you know, just lead to slightly more consistent magic for the next couple of years. Yeah, there's not, there's not a lot of the loading screen problem, which I feel right. modern is kind of dealing oh, with. Yeah. Oh, God. The can I shuffle some more, right. and then, then can oh, I shuffle yeah. some more, and then can I wait and look at things on top of my library that uh, Legacy has, for example. You know, so, so the ability to sort of get away from loading screens yeah. and it'll be like, do I want it? Nah, I don't want it. Yeah. You know, like that's, that's, the most, you that's the most that you're doing. That's, that's nice, it's short, and, uh, and, and you know, life just can't be magic online. Yeah. You, know, you can't just have the shuffler <laughs> take care of it. You have to shuffle, you have to present, exactly. they have to cut, you have to put it back in place, blah, blah, blah. And, and this sort of smooths them over in that, in that realm. So right. the, the, I, I, remember, uh, I remember reading something about like, we, you chose the gate crash cycle of dual lands to let the gate crash cycle have sort of more time than the other cycles because in gate crash you had to wait for them. Return around because had their duels, and then gate crash had their duels. Exactly. And so you kind of have that push pull in that regard. And was uh, was there any other thinking in regards to which ones come first? Yeah, I mean th there were a lot of like originally we were gonna do allied enemy. Mm -hmm. and originally like the, so you you have uh, these policies that are like the the cities. So they're blue green or sorry they're blue white 
uh, white green and white red. Mm -hmm. So he thought about like doing those and then doing like the underwater and then doing the two that were the gold planeswalkers in the set. Right. That would have made some degree of sense. Right. Initially, eventually though, it was like, okay, well, whatever. Like there's <laughs> more environmental considerations to think about. Right. You're not going to just be casting your gold cards off this one rare cycle of lands. Sure. People may not even get the polis thing anyway. We didn't even know how much we cared about that. Right. I mean, it was going to be like white green was kind of Amazonia, blue white was kind of Athens. Red white was kind of Sparta. Right. But it's like okay, we can be that other ways, and eventually the environmental considerations just won out. Right. Um, you know, there's an argument to be made. You should actually do it the other way because it's like okay, Gate Crash is the most recent, so you want to shake it up more, and so right. you could do the Return to Ravnica ones again. But I also I I, I think this argument's a totally solid argument and makes right. sense to me. Right. So. It's not like it's a hundred percent like the right answer, but it's just yeah, an answer. It's a, it's a That's decision fine. that you make. Right. It's yeah. just a decision. It's good. All right. So. That's all the cards I wanted to go over. You kind of you kind of step back a little bit yeah. and you go, here's Woo! Theros. Here's your, here's one of the things you worked on. Now you've worked on their sets after Theros. You yeah. worked on the, even all all the way into Huey next fall. But this was you know this was this was something that you were like deep in. You yeah. had your claws in this one. Well, we all I think really I mean I was on the design team and the development team, so I right. clearly worked a lot on this set. But I think we all really took tremendous ownership over this set. Mm -hmm. When Innistrad was coming out, we everyone knew it was going to be awesome. I remember talking to Brad Nelson shortly before the release of it, and I was like, dude, you're you're going to dig this. <laughs> um, and, and this felt the same way. We, you know, it was the first time we r really did a top-down theme, um, you know, top-down resonance like we did with Innistrad. We knew that hit a great note with players. We knew we liked it. Right. We knew we had great core mechanics. We had Morrow and Eric working with one another again. Yeah. We had just a great design team, a great development team. And, I mean, I, I think, you know, as, as exciting as Return to Ravnica was, and, I mean, mm -hmm. it was very exciting. Players really loved that set. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and, and that block, it was going back to something that we'd done before. Right. And, it, you know, it was going back to something that, by and large, a bunch of other people had done before. It's true. <laughs> and so it's cool to really sort of take the lessons that we've learned from the way that we make magic nowadays mm -hmm. and make an entirely new set from the ground up. Right. And Theros, you know, we'd never push top-down environment this hard except in Innistrad. Mm -hmm. We'd wanted to do Grease for a while. We'd wanted to do Enchantments for a while. Right. We had a mechanic in Heroic that we thought was awesome but looked weird, and so we wanted players to be able to experience that. Sure. We got to embrace this rich history of mythology that's been ba it baked into magic from the beginning. Mm -hmm. I, I think, we, you know, I, I love this set. Theros is my pride and joy. Right. Uh, but I think everybody who worked on it has really high expectations and really high excitement for this set. Right. Well, I mean, I think it delivered in a variety of ways. We're out there playing it. It plays amazing. I love it. There's a lot of sort of haymakers. There's tricks that take you back into the game when you thought you were out of it. Like, there's a ton of play in this thing. The cards are super exciting. I'm excited to play with it. Zach, you're awesome. Thank you so much, Evan. Thanks, it's great buddy. to be back on the Magic Show. Woo! And so, <laughs> until next time, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Evan Irwin with Zach Hill, tapping the cards so you don't have to.